sorry that you have to have to do that. But. <laughs> What is the, you're doing the Oxford Handbook as well, right? Sort of the... I'm in lots of Oxford Handbooks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome, everybody. I'm Rob Penzer. I'm the Associate oh, yeah. Director of the Helix Center. Uh, just a reminder, please uh, turn off your cell phones as we um, are live streaming this event, and uh, active phones will interfere with, uh, with that. Uh, a few announcements of upcoming Roundtables on Saturday, October 24th. We have the Realm of Mystery with Columbia University Professor of Philosophy, Carol Rovain, University of Chicago Professor of Theoretical Astrophysics, Michael Turner, U University of California, Santa Barbara Professor of Jewish Studies, Elliot Wolfson, and Princeton Professor of English, Susan Wolfson. Then on Saturday, November 7th, our program is Speak Memory with NYU Professor of Neuroscience, Christina Alberini, UC Irvine Professor of Philosophy, Sven Bernecker, NYU Professor of Neuroscience, Tom Carew, City University London Professor of Cognitive Psychology, Martin Conway, and University of Manchester Senior Lecturer of Neuroscience, Penelope Lewis. Then on Saturday, November 21st, we have Translation Matters with Princeton Professor of French and Comparative Literature, David Bellows, Sarah Lawrence Professor of Comparative Literature, Bella Brodsky, UC Santa Barbara Director of Translation Studies, Suzanne Gillivine, author and Metropolitan Museum of Art Director of Publications Program, Mark Polizotti, and SUNY New Paltz Associate Professor of English, Michelle Woods. Now, in collaboration with the French multidisciplinary think tank, L'Association des Amis de Passage, Helix will be holding a three-day symposium on December 4th, 5th, and 6th called A Freudian Perspective on What Ails the World Today featuring an international roster of scholars addressing issues of education, identity, nationalism, and fundamentalism. And now for today's program, Understanding Genius. When I announce your name, please raise your hand just so the audience will recognize you. Steve Shu is Vice President for Research and Professor of Theoretical Physics at Michigan State University. Rex Young, Assistant Professor of Neurosurgery at the University of New Mexico. Darren McMahon, Mary Brinsmead, uh, Brinsmead Wheelock Professor of History at Dartmouth College. Dean Keith Simonton, Distinguished Professor of Psychology at the University of California, Davis. Unfortunately, uh, Joanne Ruthsatz uh, from Ohio State, who uh, was scheduled to be here, um, was unable to join us because of uh, the inclement weather, which uh, canceled her flight. So we'll begin now. <laughs> Genius just emerges like that. Well, that is a, a long-running theory that, uh, that, that genius is spontaneous. Um, and I think that uh, researchers here would probably argue that's not the case, that uh, genius often takes a lot of work. That, that Edison, when he said that genius is 99% perspiration and 1% in inspiration was... Uh, uh, more on to uh, truth, and yet it's interesting that we seem to like that idea, the idea of the apple falling and Newton just discovering the law of gravity like that, even though we know he worked 18 hours a day. So. In fact, when Newton was asked, uh, how do you come up with all these great ideas? He just says, I ponder a lot. <laughs> and, and it's not just the amount of work they put in, thinking over and over and over again about whatever obsesses, obsesses them, but they make a tremendous amount of mistakes along the way. You know, there's all these false starts. Of course, a lot of times you don't see it because um, either it's not published or if it's art, it ends up in the basement in storage or, you know, some other kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's filtered. But the, 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 the number, even in Albert Einstein, who's like a prototype, had all these horrendous errors, particularly in developing his unified, yeah. Yeah, unified field theory. There was a good book that was out a couple of years ago called Einstein's uh, Mistakes. Yeah. I reviewed it, uh, and, it and it's about just this, yeah. you know, the, the creative uh, errors that one makes on the way to truth. And you have to do it. And he even, had, he even justified it. He says, um, mistakes in science are okay as long as they're big enough. <laughs> <laughs> Tell your students that. <laughs> right, you know. 
I think it's worth clarifying that uh, humans like narrative and simple stories, and so often we attach uh, achievement or results to an individual when in fact there are quite a few people who contributed. So it's, I think that is not to say that I don't believe that there are geniuses in the world, there certainly are, but the true story is almost undoubtedly more complicated than the one that we're familiar with. All right. And it's even true for someone like Albert Einstein. At the very beginning, uh, when he was a nobody, he used his first wife as kind of a sounding board for a lot of his ideas. And some people even say that she probably contributed more, in particular to the special theory of relativity, than she got credit for. Um, they made a deal when they got divorced that he would get the war and she would get the money. <laughs> <laughs> And a lot of people don't realize that later on, um, he got in over his head mathematically, and so had to take on mathematical collaborators. He wouldn't have been able to develop his later theories. And um, later on, uh, when he was working on his uh, general theory relativity, he got into a kind of a contest with a distinguished mathematician, Poincaré, and um, it was really kind of close for a while because he didn't have the mathematical ability to do what he needed to do. So. Well, can something be said about the differentiation between collaboration and um, inspiration and, and the subsequent aspiration of, I'm thinking of, you know, fifth century Athens or Elizabethan England or um, uh, Renaissance Florence where you didn't necessarily have, I mean, there were some collaborations, but the emergence of these geniuses on, 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 on multiple fronts uh, you know, that there's something also about the inspiration? I, I think there are special moments in history where either the cultural uh, background is particularly conducive to some kind of breakthrough, or in the case of science, what is often the case is you have theoreticians who have ideas, but the experimental technology is not there to test those ideas. So for example, today we have a lot of people working on things like string theory, which are to this moment actually completely untested by experiment. And it may turn out, when we look back a thousand years from now, we may say, hey, these guys were geniuses and they developed a full theory of quantum gravity with no experimental input. Or it might be a thousand years from now, people look back and have completely forgotten about string theory. Um, Einstein was lucky because his theories were tested very soon after he made them. And they were both conceptually deep and broad breakthroughs, but they were also verified as true very soon mm -hmm. afterward. And that's why he has become such a singular history, uh, singular figure in the history of genius. Verified and, and publicized, too, and I think that's mm -hmm. critical. I mean, it's when, it's, it's in 1917, you know, uh, 12 years after the, the Annus Mirabilis of 1905, when he writes these, do I have a problem with this? It seems to me, yes. All right. And the voice. Okay, uh, it's 12 years after he's done his major work, and yet it's you know publicly uh, uh, announced and verified. And it's then in 1917 when he becomes this kind of world saint, really, uh, mm -hmm. all over all over the world. And he's the only genius that we really have access to his brain. So, <laughs> that's, that's not true. well, I, there's the, we start harvesting brains in the 19th century, and there are all kinds of bits and pieces of geniuses, finger bones, even penises. It's uh, been studied very, uh, very de deliberately, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so we've had bits and pieces of Einstein's brain, and people are very fascinated uh, with it. We have Lenin's brain, we have sure. other other brains as well, but it's been studied and, and made slowly accessible, and people are fascinated. Uh, by you know this brain, what is in this head that makes uh, sure. this individual so uh, remarkable? And I, I was talking with a friend earlier when they looked into his brain. It was rather unremarkable when they yeah. first looked at it. It was right. somewhat smaller than uh, the average uh, human brain for a person, even for a person his age, until people started remarking on it and finding these uh, unusual bits and pieces that were uh, a bit different than other brains. I thought it had lateral, ex exceptional lateral connectivity between left and right, or is that just a is that apocryphal? It's a bit apocryphal. I mean, they have the, one of the first studies they looked at. Um, his uh, 
Angular gyrus, and they started looking at the, the, the number of glial cells versus neurons uh, in his Angular gyrus. And Whittleson, I believe, found that uh, there were higher glial ratio to, to neuron ratio. They had a bit of his frontal lobe. His brain, I don't know if people know this, but his brain was cut up into little cubes. Uh, right soon after his death, he died of a aorta, aortal aneurysm, so his brain was relatively preserved uh, uh, from his uh, untimely death and cut up his brain in little cubes and sent them around. They had a piece of his frontal cortex and a piece of his parietal cortex, and they took a look at it, and they found that his frontal cortex wasn't particularly unusual in terms of neural to glial ratio, but a part of his angular gyrus was, uh, was unusual. Um, parts of his uh, corpus callosum uh, are unusual in terms of its connectivity. People have looked at that. Uh, his motor cortex has a knob on it, uh, which they have hypothesized is uh, involved with his uh, uh, violin playing. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, does this have anything to do with genius at all? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's worth, I always like to point out that Einstein left explicit instructions uh, in his will Not that, to, that yeah. in no bar, part of his body would be uh, yeah. left behind. And so it was taken without knowledge of that will, but against his will, yeah. by this uh, a very amusing man who you know, kept the brain in a beer cooler for a while and drove it in the back of his Pontiac around the yeah. country. And, uh, um, but you know, that, that kind of fascination with the body parts of genius actually has a long history, as I say. Or and, other uh, saints, for that uh, matter, as, well, you, as you indicated. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that, that in itself says something interesting, that we want to put our fingers on, on the genius part. And, yeah. and frankly, I think this is a little silly. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, I don't know about the brain science here, but the, my understanding is, that, I agree. You know, yeah, oh, I agree. That the you know the, the effort to locate uh, Einstein's genius, genius in, in his brain is kind of just silly. And yet, sometimes I, you, end, I'm sorry. No, sometimes no. you end up with this this thing like happened with the phrenologists mm -hmm. because they were the sure. Some people even say that modern cognitive science is the neo phrenology. Mm. Right? Yeah, yeah. You're trying to find where in the brain you know genius is located or inside is located or whatever. Yeah. And um, way back in the early days of phrenology, they uh, analyzed did the same kind of postmortem. Okay. Well, it was easier because you didn't have to have the brain tissue. Right. You just had to have the skull, mm. and then you go, you know. And um, and this guy, I forget who it was, an early phrenologist, pointed out. It might have actually been Gall. I don't know. Pointed out that um, the area of the of the cranium that w is responsible for um, mathematical ability in Descartes was actually depressed instead of bumped out. And so they argued on the basis of that negative evidence that his mathematical ability must be tremendously overestimated. <laughs> <laughs> it's not clear that what purports to be Descartes' skull is even his skull. That's his yeah, return to France yeah, and the French Revolution. But there is this fascination of trying to understand. I mean, uh, so your intelligence, your creativity, all of these things arise in your brain, at least uh, in part. So trying to understand the complexity of that relationship between brain and behavior mm. is certainly a worthy endeavor. Sure. But uh, looking at uh, you know, the corpus callosum or the motor strip or the angular gyrus uh, is going to be fraught with uh, phrenological uh, types of uh, uh, underpinnings. You, you're not talking at all about uh, IQ. Yeah. So you are we, separating we could, genius from IQ. We, we could talk about IQ. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you yeah. Want to. yeah. Well, no, I, I just, I mean, one would have thought you would say, well, somebody who has an IQ of 100 and something or other is considered the genius, but you're not going there at all. I, I'll well, talk about I, that. Yeah. Well, we can I, all do it, yeah. I, we can all do I, it. I, <laughs> oh, you go, you go ahead. I, I suspect we're using the term to mean someone who has achieved something great, and so there are many people who have high IQs who do not achieve great things. However, the, the probability that someone will achieve something great, I think, is monotonically increasing with IQ, and um, if you test uh, eminent scientists, randomly selected eminent scientists, you will find that they tend to have very high IQs. But of course, nothing in human life is deterministic. So there are plenty of people who are seven feet tall and are not going to play in the NBA. But um, the, yeah. the fraction of seven footers in the US who play in the NBA is exceptionally high. Right. Can I just say one thing? I teach the history of psychology, and I have a little section on this. It's really kind of upsetting to me what happened to the, to the term genius, because it was originally designed to refer to outstanding achievement. Yeah. And then there was this guy at Stanford University named Louis S. Terman, Louis M. Terman, who decided he was going to do this massive longitudinal study of high IQ kids. That's obviously these kids were little kids, boys and girls, so that you can't talk about outstanding <laughs> achievement. 
and, um, and follow him all the way through adulthood. And he called this genetic studies of genius. Genetic, by the way, can also mean developmental, not necessarily, you know, heredity. And, Termins, um, termites. What? Termites. Termites. It's termite. Yeah, they're yeah. called termites. And the thing is, is that he had to pick an arbitrary selection um, criteria. So he picked 140. And if you look at a lot of dictionaries, like the American Heritage Dictionary, they say a genius is someone who has an IQ of 140 or above. That was a totally arbitrary decision. Yeah. <laughs> it could have been 136 or 152.1. at point one. In, in fact, <laughs> no, none of the kids who passed the threshold of 140 won the Nobel Prize. There were two physicists who just missed qualifying, Shockley yeah. and Luis oh, Alvarez, yeah. who did win the Nobel Prize. Now, there's some claim that the test that was used was primarily verbally loaded, and these two were much stronger mathematically and probably would have qualified had he used a slightly different kind of IQ test. But, but so a lot of people will use the fact that none of the termites won the Nobel Prize as evidence that IQ has nothing to do with achievement. But that is completely wrong, actually. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting that two of the termites grew up and ended up being professors at Stanford University. And they took over this longitudinal study that was still continuing. So they became subjects in their own study. <laughs> <laughs> Re well, in, ter <laughs> yeah. in, in Terman's uh, study, I mean, it was, it, it was incredibly flawed. He got involved with the, with the he children's lives. He wrote letters lives. of recommendation for him. Yeah, he wrote letters of recommendation for him. So, I mean, it was, it was a, a horribly flawed study from, um, from that perspective as well. There's it was incredibly a biased, more, experimental bias. Was in, there's was a there. more modern variant of the Terman study, which is still ongoing, called there's two variants of it, SMPY and SVPY, mm -hmm. study of mathematically or verbally precocious youth. And probably some of the children of people in this room are in the study. But if you score above a certain level by the age of 13, you're admitted to this study. Mm -hmm. And the oldest people in the study now, I think, are in their 50s. And so you can ask, well, as the IQ gets higher and higher, does the probability of some level of achievement increase? And so you can, for example, show that someone who's at the one in 10,000 level of ability is many times more likely to have a patent at mm -hmm. age of 45 uh, than someone who was only in the top 1%. So th there's no diminishing returns to intelligence even as you get to the one in 10,000 level of ability. Um, probability of being tenured at a major research university also monotonically increasing. So even within the, what we would consider already very high scores, top 1%, well, as you go from top 1% to top 1 in 10,000, there are significant differences in those populations. And the major thing about that study, unlike what happened in the Terman one, is they actually got people who you would, we would consider geniuses. Yeah, they for example, up. they have Fields medalists. I don't yeah, think they have Terrence any Tao. Yes, I, Terrence Tao is in it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, good example of that. Yeah. Um, absolutely outstanding. And also interesting because one of the issues that sometimes arises when you talk about genius is mad genius. And, and Terrence Tao is just a totally normal guy. <laughs> well, if you, if you met Terrence, you, you would say he clearly is not a, he's a little bit on the Asperger's Asperger spectrum. Side. But, but for someone that smart, he is very normal. Yeah, I, I would right. put it I that way. I should have qualified. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you said we're, uh, we're not talking about IQ, but just to link up what we were talking about earlier, brain studies, cranial studies, IQ, when the IQ exam is developed uh, in the 1890s in, in France by a man by the name of Henri Binet, and it's Louis Terman who takes that uh, uh, research and, then, and, and sort of instrumentalizes it. Binet was actually very interested in cranial studies as well, uh, and I see the IQ exam as kind of growing out of this long 19th century uh, attempt to locate genius. Uh, and some of that research, I think, should give us real pause. Um, it's not coincidental that, that Terman was an anti-Semite, uh, that um, you know, he, he had uh, unsavory views about uh, race. Um, he was a, uh, an acolyte of, of Francis Galton, uh, who was an important uh, scientist, the uh, nephew of, of Charles Darwin, uh, whose first book is entitled Hereditary Genius, and who's very interested in how to identify genius in population pools, but who's also the father of eugenics, uh, as, as people in the room will know. So it, it's sort of just you know, worth pointing out those connections, those long filial connections. That's not to cast IQ out, uh, out, of, uh, out of the discussion by any means, but uh, there's, a, there's a dark history there, too. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he, he even manifested in, the, in the, the Terman's study because you mentioned Shockley. 
he really resented that he didn't have an IQ <laughs> high enough. And he, he spent the rest of his life, you know, resenting it and, and he basically stealing the transistor idea for some colleagues, you know. I mean, not I, completely. I, I'm not sure he stole it, but, but uh, yeah, I mean, he but, took he took more credit than yeah, with his. But that's true. But he got, he yeah. got got one up in the end because he contributed his sperm to the Nobel Prize sperm right, bank, right? right? Yeah, so, uh, exactly. <laughs> He'll have more. Uh, I don't make this more, stuff up. More to say later. Yeah. <laughs> and he ended up doing in line with the tradition, going back to Galton, you know, start arguing about superior and inferior races. Right. As well. Yeah. But um, I would say, to some extent, we live in Galton and Terman's world today, even though we don't think about it anymore. So in, uh, long ago, we would not have thought that we could use standardized tests to filter talent or to allow X access to valuable educational resources. But this is exactly what we do in our society. So if you want to get into MIT, you have to do quite well on these standardized tests, which are essentially IQ tests. Yes. And so American society is quite ordered in some sense al along achievement lines on these exams. And if you go to places like Japan or China where admission to college is based on a single exam, um, again, you have a society that's actually filtering based on brain power and then allowing those people who have above average ability uh, more access to educational resources. It's an elitist uh, meritocracy. Well, yeah, yeah. and I, I mean, it is interesting that, it, that the United States adopted use, uh, the, the use of these kind of standardized exams uh, very quickly and took to it uh, much more aggressively than other countries. Um, mm -hmm. right. That says something about American society, as you say, a kind of elitist meritocracy. Right. I don't disagree with you, but if you look at how admission to a cold normal superior or a cold polytechnique mm -hmm. in, in France, it's even more elitist than what we have the here. Gagne. It's, it's, much, yeah, more, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. much more elitist. So, so in fact, it's not fair to tar Americans only with this brush. In Japan and China and Korea, same thing. There is a gaokao or high exam that you take when you leave high school. And if mm -hmm. you do well in it, you go to Beijing yeah. University. And if you don't, then. Well, China has had that as the civil service thousand exam. Years, thousands thousand years, thousands of years, yeah. yeah. I'm ta just talking about the, the type of exam. I mean, to get into yeah. the Ecole de Mars um, you, you do the Kanye and you yeah. do a whole set of it's exams. It's more focused. Yeah. It's not a, uh, it's not a um, exam that, like IQ yeah. at all. It's, it's based on content. Uh, right. And that's a different method. So that's and that, what I was that another interesting thing that, ha thing that happened to IQ is that the original conception of intelligence when Binet was working on it was actually much broader. Yeah. He was looking at mental what, retardation. Mental, yeah, exactly. He, yeah, he actually started looking at the lower end yeah. for special what education. He was interested what we would in call original. special education. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also the items were much broader. He was just looking at what are the kind of things that kids are able to do as they mature intellectually. And, and who, so might need, bunch, who might need additional help to succeed in an educational right. environment. And then it got kind of inverted. It was actually term inverted because he went from studying yeah. people who are on the lower end to, to people the on the upper end. And part of that also was narrowed because of the emphasis on increased reliability of the test. So what you do is you, to, to increase the reliability, you have to throw out the items that have lower correlations with the overall score. And guess what? When you throw out those items, they have to do with things like creativity and moral decision making, mm. things that aren't part of intelligence, obviously. Right. I, I think that's a very <laughs> important point. So when you're measuring analytic ability or some kind of very well-defined um, intelligence, then it can roughly, crudely be measured by these IQ tests. Things like creativity, uh, yeah. ability to work well with other people, ability to inspire other people, those mm -hmm. have never been things that we've been able to measure to operationalize mm -hmm. in a reliable way in tests, and therefore they get de-emphasized in our I society. I would disagree. So um, they're, they're getting better with uh, measures of creativity, the creative achievement questionnaire is yeah. a reliable and validated measure, and personality is getting much, much better at uh, measuring particular personality variables. So not, IQ is the gold standard yeah, the gold that standard. they can measure better than height in the doctor's office, yeah. believe it or not. Um, <laughs> but uh, it is an incredibly reliable and valid, yeah. uh, validated st uh, standard uh, to shoot for, but creativity measures and personality measures the, are getting the better. The problem with personality, so if you, it is very difficult to cheat on an IQ test, because yeah. to cheat you'd have to, have to be right. smart. But you can cheat on a personality yeah, test be because trained. I can yeah. imagine my sociopathic friend and yeah. say, I'll answer the way he would answer. Yeah, or I'll answer, I'll, right. I'll answer pro social <laughs> yeah. ways so that yeah. I can get into, I can right. get this job that so, I need. Yeah. So that's the problem with personality tests. Yeah. Although I, I agree, they do have some, they have validity and reliability as well. If I got tell you how to, how to cheat right now, right now, the personality variable that correlates most strongly with uh, creativity in a wide range of areas openness. is the openness to experience. Yeah. Okay. So, 
you already know how to answer all the questions. And at times I ask you, mm. are you, yes. are you be interested in trying a new <laughs> do you want to do, All these people in this country? room are open to new experiences <laughs> right. because they're here by, right. by, yeah, by right. definition. <laughs> right. Guaranteed. <laughs> yeah. Want to go to poetry readings? Do I want to go see art? Do I want to, yeah. Do I want to try new food? Yeah. Uh, that's the openness to experience. And yeah, but, it's easy to cheat on. But, but, but that just reinforce on he said, I, you, IQ is a gold standard that I think will never be met because it has been homogenized into what it's measured. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, like Howard Gardner came up with this. Well, initially seven intelligences, but he's added some Multiple additional ones. Yeah. And he's sometimes been criticized because he says some of those intelligences don't really have measures for them. It's because their creativity and personality. Yeah, very personality, you know, like, like, like uh, interpersonal intelligence yeah, yeah. and intrapersonal intelligence. And, yeah. and uh, uh, was it the kinematic? Kinesthetic. Kinesthetic mm. yeah. intelligence, yes. right. And they can't, I mean, what do you do? Have someone do a layup and, and then <laughs> give them a score? I mean, it, it's, it's, there's no, so is that really a criticism but of I, but his, I, I, I think yeah. the, the criticism is usually, of, of Gardner is usually not that his constructs exist. People agree that his constructs exist. The question is, can you operationalize it? Can you actually measure right. it in a reliable way? And right. on that question, the answer is no. You right. can't. And that's why he ended up going from kind of looking at it in, in the general population to focusing on genius, yes. on creative achievement, yeah. like, and creating minds. And then, then there's no question. So you started out with the question about uh, intelligence and genius, but mm. do you think creativity and personality variables are critical to the manifestation of genius? I, mm -hmm. I, well, yeah, that's the whole point, is, yeah. is to me, it's not a single dimension. I mean, right. we can talk about um, G, you know, and intelligence. So the cows come it's home. been yeah. well demonstrated. It's very hard to get rid of it. So intelligence is likely in, it, it, it necessary, but not sufficient yes. to achieve uh, genius. Yeah. And yeah. that's why when you talk about, yes, yeah. you have a, a, a monotonic line, yeah. but just huge scatter around exactly. the line. Yeah. Exactly. These are all noisy predictors. And, and the reason why they're scatter is this person has high openness of experience, and this person has low openness experience. The person who has the highest recorded IQ, she took the, yeah. the uh, Stanford <laughs> Binet when she was a little girl and got a perfect score. And she writes uh, Marilyn Vosavon. Yeah, Vosavon. Marilyn Vosavon. She writes an advice I mean, column. I, 226 is a really good IQ. <laughs> <laughs> she ended up in the Guinness Book of Records. Yeah. But what is she doing? Right. She, you know, I, I, I hope she's not here. <laughs> <laughs> But I, it's I'm a sorry, really good, it's a good achievement that she, she's doing she, very she's well. She's writing a column for a, parade, a Sunday supplement in which people ask dumb questions. <laughs> that she answers. A lot of it, that she answers. I mean, a lot of them are really dumb. You're like, why in winter should you wear dark clothing? <laughs> <laughs> And she gives a very That's intelligent a answer that you look up by Googling. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, to me, she's sort of the prime example of, you know, having a supreme IQ. She's basically a specialist in taking IQ tests. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. She's taken every IQ test you can possibly imagine, including one for, there's one for the Four Sigma Society. That's four standard deviations above the mean. Mm. And I've seen some of the um, questions, and I'll admit it, <laughs> I couldn't understand what they were asking. <laughs> Dean, don't feel bad. I don't even look at those questions. I know. That. <laughs> you know, it's like, maybe that's the test. If, if, are you smart enough to realize these questions don't actually ask anything? Yeah. <laughs> these questions are nonsense. <laughs> so genius requires intelligence, but then there's something else. Yes. And, uh, there's a secret and, sauce. Right, the, the sort of X factor. And that's, it. Cicero uh, called it the quidum de winum, the, the kind of divine something that somebody like Socrates had. Socrates thought he had a, a daimonian, a little sort of spirit that followed him around and whispered in his ears. In fact, uh, that's the Greek term daimonian, the diminutive daimon, gives us our word demon. But in Latin, that's called a genius, which is just like the word genius. And originally the idea was that, you know, the genius, that extra something uh, was breathed into you by a god or a muse uh, or implanted in you by the gods. But it was a divine, special uh, something that ordinary human beings didn't have. Are you right? saying that's a genetically uh, it, it induced talent? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying anything about genetics. <laughs> so we, we, we mentioned uh, fascination with measuring the brains of these deceased geniuses. Well, I think the next step, which will be realized as technology improves, is, of course, measuring the genomes. Yeah. Uh, 
it's happening geniuses as we speak, and, right? yeah, and it's yeah. happening as we speak. So, so I just I just hosted a meeting of the International Society for Intelligence Research, and Robert. Oh, you were Pl yes, that's Robert right. Plowman was yes. There. Yeah. James, and, did you go to James Lee's talk? I did. Okay. Yeah, yeah, very very impressive yeah. talk, and and so they're searching for the genes of genius and or high intelligence anyway and uh, having a hell of a time finding them. Um, and a lot of them, right? I mean, it, well, yeah, yeah. A, a lot of them in, in multiplying uh, dramatically. So Robert Plowman has made uh, his life mission finding uh, this gene, uh, gene for genius. And uh, turns out that there's not a gene, and there's not a hundred gene and genes, and there's not a thousand yeah. genes, but there's probably uh, thousands and thousands. And they're kind of, of interchangeable, genes. so it's not like the same genes that appear in every single And it's genius. not for every single person. It's yeah. really a complex complex story. And the, the, the takeaway for me um, w was twofold. Um, so you have this bell-shaped curve. Now we're all very interested at this high end of the curve because and we're all smart people and we're here at this talk and we're talking about genius. But evolution is selecting for the middle of the curve. Mm. That is where the sweet spot is for mm. uh, replication, natural selection to occur. Mm. And that's where the action is at the gene. So Robert Plowman is looking for booster genes mm. when actually uh, there's suppressor genes. Um, and the lack of suppressor genes that decrease your intelligence is what is actually the big story. And uh, Dr. Lee and Dr. Plowman are finding these stories that the lack of these suppressor mm. genes are really more interesting than these booster genes for but high IQ. There is one area where there's been, I think, more success to look at the genetic basis of genius, and that is not the focus on IQ, but the focus on personality. Yeah. Because we, we know like that most major personality traits have very strong genetic component, usually around 50% on the average yeah. for credibility. And what's also interesting about this research is that um, it's helped us understand a little bit more a very important issue that, that has gone well, goes all the way back to Plato and Aristotle, the mad genius issue. What's yeah. the relationship between genius and madness? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, Aristotle says that uh, all geniuses are, even in politics, he said, you know, suffer from melancholy, which is just his word for depression. And depression. Okay. Yeah. And he was probably a depressed guy. Black bile. Because he listed <laughs> philosophy as, as one of the <laughs> characteristics. And, um, and what's interesting to me is that they, it, this, there is evidence that there are shared, there's a shared genetic basis between certain kinds of mental illness and certain kinds of creative achievement. Mm. It's not that highly creative people are mentally ill, it's just that there's, a, there's certain things that allow them to be creative that are shared with people who are mentally ill because they don't have whatever the moderating variables are. For example, reduced latent inhibition. Yeah. I was going to say, what do you think those cognitive variables yeah, are? Yeah, the cognitive yeah. variables, they just can't, they, they have less ability to filter out irrelevant information. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? That actually is useful sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you filter out something that's irrelevant, it actually may be something that, well, like serendipity. All serendipity, by definition, is irrelevant. And so you've got to spot it. I mean, that's domain specific though, right? I mean, in other words, one can imagine a correlation uh, between poetic genius uh, and a form of mental instability mm -hmm. because making metaphor is drawing you know, connections between dissimilar things and you move that a little bit over and you got schizophrenia and you can see how that right. might be. But, but presumably in other domains, uh, not, you know, well, maybe not <laughs> well, He's going to tell you something uh, okay. different. No, okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, this is obviously very complicated, but if you look at um, it's like scientific genius, they, it, their leanings are towards the autism spectrum. Right. Okay. So the mathematics, for example, yes. And, and so, in, in a sense, it's the opposite because they're so incredibly focused. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you figure out Albert Einstein, um, when, he, when he worked out his theories, a lot of people don't realize, they're like, oh, you just come up with E equals MC squared and then and you're done. <laughs> I, I'm afraid he had to do calculation after calculation out of, after calculation. He um, would often get those calculations wrong and would have to redo them. Uh, he worked, he published three papers on, um, on the size of a, a molecule, kind of a dumb thing. That's what he did his doctoral dissertation on. He got Avogadro's number wrong. He got it wrong again, and he finally, only a third calculation, he finally got it right, predicting it on the basis of his, his observation of the theory. So, um, you know, it's, you have to be very, very focused in science, be obsessed yeah. with that up a given I, domain. I think you're absolutely right, um, but I, I would make one observation, which is that, you know, the, the enormous 
powers of concentration that are required if you want to do high-level mathematics or yeah. theoretical physics, those are developed. So when right. I was a kid growing up, my father, who was an engineering professor, I always thought of him as absent-minded, and I used to joke. <laughs> I used to joke with him, and I used to say, "I'm," and I was kind of a normal kid, I thought, at least I think. And I used to say to my dad, "Hey, I'm never going to be as absent-minded as you, Dad. I think I'm different than you." And he said, "Well, you know, just just wait, because uh, if you want to do the work that I do." You have to think. And when you're thinking, people will think you're absent-minded. Right. And so what's actually happened is that now, as a kid, I could not hold some really complicated mathematical thing in my head and manipulate it. But now I can. Right. It's developed. And so now my kids look at me, and they, I'm doing something, but they don't realize I'm doing right, something. Right. They think I'm ignoring them or absent-minded. So it's a little bit more complicated than you think. It's, right. They may actually be doing their work when they appear to be... Uh, yeah. You know. I mean, sometimes, I mean, Einstein would ha be talking with some guests, and all of a sudden... His, his mind would be elsewhere. He'd get up and go out of the room. <laughs> and, 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 what if there's, and, and what if there's two main things that our brain does that's analogous to evolutionary processes? Mm -hmm. Blind variation and selective retention. Mm -hmm. And so the, this, this is the, the mechanism of evolutionary pro processes. And this is kind of what you're describing, this variation process where you're thinking up lots of different ideas and you can do mental simulations, but then you have to selectively retain and you have to drill down. Mm -hmm. And at one extreme, and I wrote a paper on this that I think you reviewed as well, mm -hmm. Right. wrote a paper on this that at one extreme, blind variation can devolve into psychosis where everything is related to everything mm -hmm. else. Right. At the other ex uh, end of the continuum, with selective retention, things get so narrow that there's only one solution. You become very rigid in your thinking. And autism is at the end of the right. or psychopathological perspective. Right. And the brain is designed to be, again, in the middle of the uh, golden mean where blind variation and selective retention work hand in hand so mm -hmm. that you can be most adaptive for problems that are well known that you have to solve problems rapidly and accurately that's kind of an intelligence thing mm -hmm. and problems are unknown where you have to come up with a new solution right. to a problem that seems so, like the sweet spot a good example of this is John Nash who recently died yeah. and he, he's the he was the subject of this book and movie a beautiful mind and uh, he had a schizophrenic phase where he was really lost, and there were periods of time when he would wander around Princeton and just fill blackboards with just nonsense yeah. and crazy things. But then when he regained his sanity a little bit, people asked him, what were you doing all those years, John? And he said, well, these arguments that uh, God is acting with Joseph Stalin to d do something with Martians, uh, those ideas came to me from the same places that the mathematical ideas yeah. came from, and so I, I didn't you treated them. them. Yeah, I just treated them the yeah. same way. So yeah. uh -huh. it's very, very. Uh, it, I think it supports what your model. Uh, yeah. And from a neurological perspective, that's how we're starting yeah. to appreciate with networks in the brain that are involved with this variation process, the default mode network, yeah. and, and networks that are involved with the selection process, cognitive control right. networks, and how they have to work in tandem with each other. Mm -hmm. and it's not just a place in the brain, but it's these networks working hand in hand that allows us to be uniquely human and successful way, this, as humans. This is relevant to another issue. I, 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 you know, if you look over the program, they have all these really interesting issues. And, um, and some of my, I think we didn't touch upon because um, we we're missing a person who's an, yeah. an expert in that area. But one of them is why not all child prodigies grow up to become adult geniuses? And, and, there's, and it's a very complex issue. It has to do with social development, a lot of other things. But one of them is gets to this kind of blind variation and selective retention thing. Um, when, in a, when you see a lot of child prodigies, they're usually in areas where you have to acquire incredible expertise. Incredible expertise in chess, incredible expertise in mathematics, incredible expertise in um, music performance, you know, playing the violin, or piano, whatever. And at the beginning, it's really helpful to just focus and focus and focus, be yeah. very narrow and weed everything out um, be towards the autistic end of the spectrum. But as you mature, that only works for certain kinds of things. You can keep on doing that for chess. Mm -hmm. You can keep on doing that for some kind of mathematics. Mm -hmm. But there's other areas where all of a sudden you have to, the, the openness to experience. You, open you know, you're still, you're still composing music. Like Mozart's a good example. He was a phenomenal child prodigy the greatest child prodigy in music the world has ever seen. He was actually studied, a lot of people don't know this, there was, there was actually a, an article where they studied him. At the Royal Academy. Yeah. At the Royal Academy, yeah. And published in the Transactions. Mm -hmm. I just read that, reread that recently. It's yeah, a yeah. fascinating article, I mean it's obviously not. That he would go chase around a cat as, as Yeah, he was still, the that was used as a proof that he, was, <laughs> he really was his a age. Child, yeah, yeah right. he really was a yeah. child. But what was interesting is that a lot of people don't realize, but he was actually slow to mature 
as a composer. Uh, some of you may have heard this 10-year rule. It takes about 10 years. It took him longer than 10 years. He was composing at six, and it wasn't until roughly he was 29 mm. that he started composing his first That's masterpieces. And, and, what, and, and what happened is all of his stuff beginning, the really great music, but it's just kind of music that everybody else was composing. And, and there's no there there. He had to go through his death of his mother. He had to go through um, a, an unfortunate love affair and end up marrying the sister. And, and all these other kinds of things. He, he had experienced life and it broadened him so that all of a sudden he could put meaning into his music that he didn't have before. He just had the technique. And then when he puts it there, Viennese society can understand it, and uh, you know he starts losing his contract, <laughs> right, right, yeah, and yeah. dies, you know, uh, pauper. <laughs> yeah, he too. paid the consequence yeah. for it. Yeah, he became less popular. And it's, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 please. I, I was just going to say, I, you know, Dean mentioned that this this nexus between madness and genius uh, goes all the way back to Aristotle and Plato. But in the 19th century, there's quite a developed medical theory that genius is a sort of positive side effect of uh, mental degeneration. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of literature on this, but the, the story I love to tell is that the, the great French novelist Emile Zola um, suspects that he's a genius, uh, but he's also uh, uh, an acolyte of this theory, so he knows he has to be somewhat mad. So he has himself <laughs> sort of analyzed by a group of 12 French psychologists who, who you know, come to the conclusion that he's mildly neurotic, just neurotic enough to be a genius, but, you know, high-functioning. He's so, in the sweet spot. Uh, it, there you go. <laughs> but when you, uh, when you talk about Mozart, or you could talk about Matisse or Botticelli. Is IQ relevant there? We don't I, know their I, IQ. I, sus I suspect that if you took the greatest, no suppose we in this room made a list of our, who we thought were the greatest novelists, right? and you gave them all IQ tests, they would all score above average, but I think very few of them would score really off the charts the way that, you know, it, astrophysicist would score or something like that. Yeah, the so, average, the bell-shaped yeah. curve would center around 120 yeah. Yeah, on around the there. Wexler scales yeah. instead of I think of the issue here is you, is you have to, and you know, the same thing is true for the, the madness <laughs> thing, the yeah. psychopathology thing. You have to break it down by domain. Yeah. And it's not even, it's, 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 you can't do these big cuts even of like artists versus scientists because you've got to break it down mm -hmm. much more fine. For example, you look at arts, and there's actually some research done on this, for example, where th this guy compared... Um, uh, highly formal, abstract arts that are very logical, you know, like a Mondrian, for example, yeah. with highly expressive, emotive arts like uh, Jackson Pollock, for example, and, or you know, abstract expressionism in general. And guess where all the psychopathology is? It's it's on the the highly emotional, expressive, and the highly abstract form. It's like mathematics. You know, it's, it, it doesn't require that kind of openness and craziness. And but it's the same for physics, as you've shown, too. Or, or, you revolutionaries know. are more likely to show psychopathology than right. are... Theoretical more, physicists mm, versus yeah. you know, more so garden variety. So you really have to, you know, cut it fine. And then, again, just like it is for intelligence, they're scattered around. Yeah. You know, so there's, you don't have to be a crazy. Um, Einstein maybe was a little bit autistic, but he himself wasn't crazy. But he may have been carrying a gene for it because his son, his son was, mm -hmm. schizophrenic. was a schizophrenic. Yeah. You know, so. One so of, uh, I'm still not clear. Are you saying that the correlation between intelligence and genius applies primarily to fields like science, mathematics, uh, or is that uh, applicable across the board to everything, so, whether it's I, painting, I, music. Yeah, I, I think if you use the word intelligence, you have to be very careful what you mean by that. So right. because there is an operationalizable version of it called G or IQ, that's the one we tend to focus on. That one tends to be show a higher correlation with certain types of work, symbolic manipulation, mathematics, things like that, computer programming. But writing a novel, is, I think, in, has so many other ingredients in it that right. the loading on that particular kind of intelligence is decreased. Right. Um, but not absent. But not ab absent. certainly not absent. Like certainly you said, 120 absent. or something yeah. like yeah. that. Yeah. Certainly not absent. <laughs> These aren't dumb people. No. 
but they're spending more of their time thinking more concretely about I, things that happen in life. I, I think feelings. Yeah, but and, 120 I, is not a, is not a genius. No, so no. If you say, no, it's gifted well, level. No, but it's, it can be. 120, <laughs> but I, that mean? I, it's, I think, it's all relative. It depends on who the 120 person sure. is with. Uh, so yeah. yeah. I, think, I think if you if you ask, well, what is it that makes somebody a great novelist? They have to be able to read and write, but they have to think about humans and have insight into human psychology and life and. And those are things which are not measured by these tests. So, so someone may be very, very off scale in their insight into human, uh, in human psychology. They may be off scale in their ability to write beautiful prose. But that's not measured by these little tests. Mm -hmm. And so they may come out as 120 on the little test, but they're one in a million in these other areas, which we just are not very good at measuring. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so why, why, don't, why isn't then the measurement made in terms of the What new did the person bring that didn't exist before? So uh, that, uh, let's right. say Manet, in terms of painting, brings something Originality at that point. Or, yeah, yeah. That's, didn't. that's the measurement that society gives in, call, in calling them the, the, the genius, yeah. the one in the million. Right. Society then gives the acclamation or the, the, uh, uh, the, the collective uh, approval that this person is has yeah. produced something so and, unusual that that is and, the, and I, the measure. I would, say, I would say that's a much deeper way of classifying genius than just giving somebody a little test. Right. This is yeah. saying, oh, you did well on the test, you're a yeah. genius, as opposed to you did, you contributed something really original. And by, by definition, you can't standardize it. No. Yeah. I mean, by, if, if, if you're going to score them on how original they are, then how do you standardize something like yeah. that? <laughs> But I, but, I yeah. would, but I would say there is one problem with this, this, uh, this societal I thought deficit. they're doing a whole set of genetic studies on it, so they are trying to standardize it, but are they standardizing it just for scientists, or are they standardizing No, I, I, all the genetic studies would use as the phenotype variable a score on a test, typically. On, like an intelligence or, test. Or a personality test, or yep. any trait, that quantitative trait that you want to measure, you can calculate, for example, the correlation between a particular gene variant and that phenotype, and that's what's being done. Yeah. But there is not a good phenotype as in uh, made original contribution to society. That's quite difficult to, to standardize and measure. Yeah. I just want to say one thing, though, I, back to my, the very first comment I made this evening. I think a lot of times we give someone credit for some huge original contribution to yeah. society, but that's a manufactured story. So that person may actually not deserve the credit that uh, we mm -hmm. give them. And so we, I think you have to be quite careful about that. Or the yeah. person didn't get it in their lifetime. Um, and and much, later they, and much later they get Van it. Van Gogh, yeah. you know, Most geniuses became, are dead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, most, most people are dead, too. Yeah. 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 And there's, yeah. you know, a huge number. We could all name examples of, uh, you know, like Emily Dickinson and... and right. Yeah. Uh, Frida Kahlo is sometimes mentioned, but she was actually pretty famous, you know. During her lifetime. During her lifetime. Yeah. She well, had one Mel of her paintings. Melville? Was Melville not, uh, I guess Moby uh, Dick was not. Uh, yeah, I think he was underappreciated, but I don't know if he was neglected. Yeah. You know, he, got, he got published. <laughs> and then there's the other example of somebody, you know, we think of uh, Edison and the light bulb. I mean, the light bulb would have been invented many times, right, right prior to that, yeah. and he seizes the moment right. at the right so there's, time. There's myth making. Right. Right. Any exactly. of our big, you know, whether it's Steve Jobs or, you know, sure. people who are big figures today, there's a tremendous amount of uh, determined, dis um, intentional myth making around all these people. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be quite careful about that. Uh, by the way, I also have to say, um, a lot of neglected geniuses are really honest to good neglected geniuses that deserve to be neglected. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had this weird experience. I published a little tiny commentary in Nature. Oh, yeah. And, and I, I just raised this issue of whether or not genius is extinct now in the natural sciences. I'm talking about physics and chemistry. Are you still being uh, in trouble for that? <laughs> that's become such, you know, so expertise driven and group oriented and, you know, big research teams and big grants. And all, that. And all of a sudden I found out that, uh, by the way, they changed the title on me. So they said, is, is, is Einstein extinct? Which is much more dramatic and sells lots of copy, but it wasn't what I intended. And there's all these people came out of the woodwork, you know, and they start saying, wait a second. I'm alive. <laughs> and, 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 and I said, well, what do you do? And he says, I've, I've revolutionized theoretical physicists. You, you should uh, appreciate this. They've actually proved that Einstein was wrong. So I said, can you like, send me a PDF of, of anything? Well, I haven't gotten accepted yet, but I have a YouTube <laughs> video. <laughs> 
Can I comment on your article? Because uh, oh, I, you I, read I, it. Okay. Well, I think it raises a very important point. So. In the era of Einstein... You didn't the, send him a YouTube, did you? I, I didn't send him a YouTube. <laughs> we have to clarify uh, that first. <laughs> in, in the era of Einstein, the top minds were drawn from a relatively small population. So if you think of the number of people today who have access to kind of first-rate university education, it might be in India, it might be in China, and then access to first-rate graduate school, yeah. it, it's an, they're enor it, it, our talent pool is enormously larger than in the time of Einstein. So yeah. there is no doubt that in some sense of, if you just measure IQ scores, mm -hmm. there are plenty of people around who are as smart as Einstein on that particular metric. But it is much more difficult to stand out today mm -hmm. because every area of science, in particular, say, physics, which I know well, is uh, being worked on by very, very smart people competing against each other and, being, and pushing things forward a little bit at a time working in big teams. Yeah. So you just don't stand out. If you took an NBA guard today and you had him play against NBA guards in 1950, he would embarrass those people. Maybe not Oscar Robertson or whatever his name is, but, <laughs> but he would embarrass almost all Jesus the other, or, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. he would embarrass almost all the other players in 1950 because he would just be off scale for the, that era. But today, he plays every game he goes to, he's evenly matched against some other players. So you don't think of that guy as a basketball genius, but he is a basketball genius. The talent genius. pool is coming Yeah, the so talent pool is just so tremendous now, and the, 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 the set of frontiers that are being pushed forward in science, whether it's in biology or physics or chemistry, is so vast that we have a lot of geniuses, but they're un, totally unrecognized geniuses. Like it's super string theory. I mean, you have to be a genius to contribute to for that. For example. Yeah, for example. Yeah. Really impressive people are doing the work in that area, but no one's really stood out. And part of it is the problem that you said earlier, you, you, you can't verify which of these, and right. this one assumes 15 dimensions, and this one's 18, so which one do you pick? Well, they both give the same prediction, so, you know. Yeah. This one's more parsimonious, I guess. But, but to your point, I mean, does that mean that there's, uh, that there's still geniuses out there? Um, or well, how do you define it? So or it, because they're not achieving, they're not able to achieve. I mean, are there geniuses, but they can't achieve? They, they, there's not the opportunity to there, make those achievements there, there's because there's just too, the talent pools. There's too an issue high, of something or? we call low-hanging fruit. Yeah. So uh, how and, long have humans been doing science per se? Yeah. A couple hundred years. So there are a lot of pretty easy things that got done early, and right. now there are a lot of things which are going to require teams of very, very, very smart people to Filling do. in the details. And so, yeah. yeah. Who's that? Well, it's not, it's not just filling in the details. So, yeah. so, you know, we don't know how to unify quantum mechanics and gravity, and maybe yeah. string theory does. That's not filling in the details. That's a very fundamental thing. Sure. But it's going to take a thousand Einstein-level people working on it to, to Thank make Thank goodness progress. the brain is completely unknown. <laughs> and the brain, we know almost nothing. We <laughs> right. still know almost nothing about the yeah. brain, right? So, yeah. It's fantastic. Um, Kant, I think this was mentioned in the your little flyer as well, um, has my favorite definition of genius. And it kind of fits in here because he, he puts the originality as the first requirement. But the second requirement is that the idea be exemplary. Mm -hmm. And what he means by that is that it, it forms a model for other people to follow and, and imitate or emulate yeah. or whatever. And I think that in the case of like Albert Einstein, like you were saying, in that period, or you know, in case of Niels Bohr or whatever, these people would come up with these ideas that people would immediately have to pick up on. I mean, you couldn't do quantum physics and ignore Niels Bohr and Heisenberg and, and the rest. So they, they reset the mark. But it's hard to know who's doing that now, you know, it's, where it's, everybody has to follow this guy or it, that guy. It's impossible for even a really great scientist in area A to yeah. actually follow what's going on in area C or D yeah, or E. Yeah. So, so you could think of the, each one as a little microcosm where some genius work is being done, but it's so specialized now that right. uh, it's very difficult for anybody to know what other, other people are doing. Right. I want to ask you about what the thing you said about the basketball player. So you are saying a basketball player today is significantly superior in his abilities to a basketball player from the 50s. Yes. Mm -hmm. What does that say exactly? It's just that the pool from which the talent is drawn is much larger. So, for and example, the training, too. and the training and, yeah. and the yeah. techniques. But let me just say the pool. So well, that so then wouldn't apply to genius because in genius the idea is that there is something the person has, a given. That makes them... So if you were a very, very smart kid and you grew up in Calcutta... In the in 1800s. 19, yeah, or even 1920, your yeah. chances of 
getting a decent education would be quite low. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas today, with the Indian Institutes of Technology, they're quite good at filtering the top young kids in India and bringing them. I mean, they're not fully efficient, but finding you know, them early, cultivating in, in, them, making sure they. One, one could argue that in the time of Einstein, the, the actual population base from which the geniuses were drawn is no more than 100 million people. Whereas now we're probably drawing from a pool of three or four bil billion people now. Mm -hmm. So. You know, but, but the idea is that if you were basing it on an IQ test, and if IQ tests existed in 16th century, that the numbers would be the same as the IQ numbers goes, are now. The average, so yeah, you are upping, so, you are, so you, you are saying that the IQ, let's say for the genius level, is now higher than it was in the 16th century. In, in, in the, IQ in, has risen. Yeah, in, yeah, the, in, the Flynn effect. The Flynn in, effect. Yeah. yeah, 100 or 150 years ago, in the richest countries in the world, like the United States, the average years of education for an adult male would be something like six years yeah. or seven years. But IQ and, shouldn't have anything to do with education. Uh, well, well you, it's related. Uh, no, no. I mean, without yeah. unless you unless you have uh, <laughs> the unless you have some good environmental basis to build on, you're not going to achieve your full IQ. So. Actual raw scores on IQ tests. So, for example, the Swiss Army, uh, sorry, the Swedish Army. There, there are various uh, entities that have been testing IQ for over a hundred years, and uh, so they have scores on the same problems that have been given over a long period of time. And so there's been a gradual increase in scores. More people are getting them right over mm -hmm. time. Because so they have to make the tests harder. Right. So, the, so the recruits that came off the farm and Sweden, and they had four years of formal education, they weren't going to do very well in these tests. The average kid does much better. Mm -hmm. um, so in some sense, the environment has gotten much better for development of intelligence for the average person. And we're right. not quite sure if it's a if it's combination or dietary factors. Nutrition. Uh, people yeah. are, are, are reading and, and using their brain in a very complex play, way. So literacy has increased over the last century. Uh, Visuospatial uh, development, people are using their brains in very complex ways. Visuospatially, this could be uh, related. So but you, this, the secular increase in IQ is a real thing. So when you go, uh, I think it's when you go to first grade or kindergarten, I think to kindergarten, there is a test they give kids. Yeah. And uh, that, t and then some of these kids also have IQ tests. So you would. We just took naps in first grade when I. <laughs> so, but, but you're, so if I understand you. If I understand it's really changed <laughs> over. Or here in New York, it's different. <laughs> if I understand you, uh, when I went to nursery school, it was obligatory to take a one hour nap in yes, the afternoon. Yes, yes. <laughs> it was. But uh, so. Are you saying that the IQ of a five-year-old or a six-year-old, when those tests applicable to that age are taken, has the potential of developing and becoming a higher number? It has. We, yeah. 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 It already yeah. has. And that's why they, and they have to rescale it. Yes. It's like what happened with the math portion of the SAT. Yeah. People are getting 800s and 800s, and they try to rescale it, and they still start getting 800 and 800. But you think of your, your genes as kind of a variance that you can be within, and you can either, if you eat a lot of lead paint and have a very restricted environment, you'll end up at the low end of that genetic <laughs> variance. But if you have a very enriched environment and have parents that read to you and you have early education programs, yeah, you'll that, end up that, at the it, high end of that, that variance. That and so the, the, farmer, the farmer in Sweden that never had an education will end up at the lower end of that yeah, variance and have and a lower IQ and, versus the farmer that has educational opportunities. And, and as you mentioned, it's not just the education, it's nutrition. How yeah. of those farmers' kids had had an orange, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, at the turn of the century, or had you an know, orange during the winter. I understand so. what you are saying. If you said to me, it's in terms of that good parenting, uh, enriching environment, All those good things, education, yeah. yeah, yeah. uh, etc., will contribute to a smarter kid. And we've had right. a secular but increase if, in all uh, If we are talking about genius, we are adding something on top of that. Yes. Right. And are you saying that that something on top of it is moving higher and higher? Not necessarily, oh. but I, I want to say the following. So suppose you have many components that contribute to genius. So one is your raw IQ. 
One is your originality, creativity. Those are all things that are distributed within populations. And if I just give you a bigger pool of people to pick from, mm -hmm. the, the person who's maximal on all of those qualities or any particular sum of those qualities will just be better because you were able to choose from a bigger pool. Okay, and so that, that's what's happening today. And a good example is the chess genius. There was an interesting study of why, why are so many chess geniuses Russians or Hungarians or whatever? Armenians. What? Or yes, Armenian? Or Armenian. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's a very simple answer because there's so many of them playing. You know, it, it, it's, it's an enriched environment. It's yeah. an enriched environment. It's very competitive. They have, you know, very beginning, you know, they have the chess clubs that are, you know, at a very, very high level. They get their ELO rating at a very young age. I mean, it's, it's you have this per capita yeah. kind of There is play. a base population that you're drawing the champion from. Yeah. And the bigger that base population, whatever the thing you're selecting for, you're going to get better champions. And but one of the things you said is there's fewer problems to solve, too. So you have this incredible secular increase in intelligence, but you don't have an increase in genius I, because I, there might be fewer problems. Or the prob say few problems to solve are few problems that yeah, are maybe solvable. Maybe you didn't say that. I, you I, said I, that. No, yeah. I would say there are few problems that people readily identify as genius problems. Okay. But let me, let me just mention that. One uh, in a million problems. Let me just mention that this thing is a million times times more powerful than yeah. the computers that we had 20 years ago. Sure. Now, mm -hmm. how did that happen? So this thing called Moore's Law is a doubling of our computing power, computer power every couple of years or so. How does that happen? The way it happens is there are thousands and thousands of electrical engineers and applied physicists who are not chopped liver, who are working, working on this right. problem <laughs> constantly. Collectively, yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. working on this problem constantly with billion dollar budgets, and yeah. you're, not, you're not aware of anything that they do, yeah. are you? Yeah. But, but are they geniuses? Nah, because they, you know, I don't know why they're not geniuses, but you're not aware of them. Right? And of course, yeah. another so, component yeah. of this, uh, as you've mentioned already, is that genius is a, is a cultural label that we apply, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, that is historically specific. People don't refer to individuals as geniuses prior to the latter part of the 17th century. The cult of genius emerges in the 18th century, and there are reasons for that. And I'm always the token historian at these gatherings, but, uh, so I will, I, I will, I'll spare you a lecture, but there are culturally specific reasons why the cult of genius emerges in the 18th century, and one of them has to do uh, with the new emphasis that's placed on originality. I, li I like to point out that um, if, if you look up the word to invent uh, or to discover, um, if you look at those, those roots, right, uh, the, the German for invent is erfinden, and it literally means to find, to come upon. Mm. And that's reflective of a cultural mindset, same with the discover, you're uncovering something, of a cultural mindset that says, you know, every truth uh, in the world has already been discovered. God knows everything. What we do as artists, as thinkers, is recreate God's perfection. So in that world, uh, you don't produce anything original. And there's a cultural impetus, rather, to imitate. Imitate is not to do anything bad. It's just to, to recreate, to perform mimesis, which is the dominant kind of mode of aesthetics prior to, prior to the 18th century. Well, in the 18th century, you start to get uh, a new emphasis placed on originality, both in the market, and I think it's not actually uh, uncoincidental that, 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 um, that the cult of genius emerges at the same time as, as commercial society, when there's a kind of emphasis on, on bringing a new product to the market, uh, tweaking a little bit you know, on the neighbor's uh, product so that you can get something new. Um, copyright law emerges at the same time. An emphasis uh, on the individual. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so I, that's all by, by way of saying that I think uh, our, our need for geniuses uh, has changed uh, over the years. And we don't need the kind of geniuses that we once needed. Um, you know, because the flip side of this is we have geniuses all over the place now, right? Every, you can learn how to be a genius. You just go, go to Amazon, you get a self help <laughs> book on genius. I'm not kidding, there are hundreds of titles. You know, yeah. you too can think like Leonardo. Well, do you think, do you think that secular change? change is, is happening to bring us back to more of a democratization of genius yeah. and that so we don't need this why, why don't why do you think this is happening that we don't need this individual genius and this I mean this I, kind I would of make the argument democratization that is happening again the cult of genius plays a religious role the genius has become kind of secular saints and that's a, a, a long story and in now its own we're all right. atheists uh, so we can well there's that <laughs> But there's also, at the heart of democracy, is a kind of uh, discomfort with genius, because yeah. geniuses are, are, are people who are naturally different and better than others. And we don't really like that. It's We're not really comfortable with that, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so I think that there's, there's always been a discomfort. Uh, and that, that sort of dialectic has worked its way out uh, over the centuries. And mm -hmm. we're at a place now where, we, you know, we live in Lake Wobegon. We're all above average, right? right. Um, I mean, so that's why there's such, such a hostility towards like gifted and education yeah. programs, because uh, they're seen to be elitist. Mm -hmm. uh, why spend money on, on this, these elite people who don't need any help? 
<laughs> They've already got a leg up. They are, they, they, yeah, they already got it made. You know, they already got the brain. So let's focus the money where it can be used, useful. You know, hmm. like egalitarianism. Thing. Yeah. Let's make everybody equal. I, I think that's exactly how Americans feel. But I would say that the true secret of the world is technological and economic advancement are basically driven by some small percentage, yeah. very small percentage of, in terms of cognitive ability of our population. Mm -hmm. And so to give you an example, uh, quantum mechanics, which was invented in the early part of the 20th century, is now in you know, roughly 10% of our GDP. So if you ask about telecommunications equipment or fancy chemicals, applied materials, all of these things require some understanding of quantum mechanics to build and develop. But maybe 0.1% of our population actually understands quantum mechanics. Uh -huh. So, and this is the other thing about the IQ thing because um, I don't like the term IQ. Uh, general intelligence, okay, um, and it relates to different areas of achievement. There are some areas where the knowledge base has become so complex that you need a very high IQ just to to master it. I mean. Physicists have uh, physicists with PhDs have an average IQ of about 140, which is the genius level according to the dictionary. Wait, according yeah, to term. Right. <laughs> right. So they so that means the average physicist is a genius. Um, psychologist, uh -oh. I hate to tell you, <laughs> 120. Uh, it's much it's, it's much lower than that. <laughs> But they're still creative. <laughs> yeah, but they're still creative, right. It's uh, probably uh, quite high for psychometricians, though. Yeah, but psychometricians, yeah. And so it, it takes a certain amount of G, general intelligence, to, to master complex, abstract knowledge bases. And physics, you know, if, if any of you have taken physics courses, that is definitely a complex, abstract knowledge base. <laughs> I only took one physics course, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just learning the math. Yeah. To, to be able to do physics. So uh, I guess as you know, I I guess my day job is as as an administrator at a big university with fifty thousand students, and one can't really even speak those words uh, in today's environment. So we cannot yeah. say the provost will look at me and say, "How come our students are having so much trouble with freshman chemistry or organic chemistry?" Surely we there is a way that everybody on our campus can pass organic chemistry or second year calculus or multivariable calculus. You can't say they're what, not smart but, enough. Well, you can't, yeah, so you cannot, so, so it's kind of amazing that we, we've been talking a little bit about this IQ construct and all this other stuff, but in higher ed, you're not supposed to say those things. You, you, yeah. It's the fault of the, the chemists that they don't know how to teach their stuff because surely everybody can understand if they really want to. And so we, I, I think there's still this tension in American society between you know, understanding that certain truths are true and you know, uh, living in some mad world of magical thinking. Right. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to say something to, to what you said, because I, I, it's one thing to say that um, the word genius, as it's currently used, now we're discussing it, is a relatively new thing. But a lot of times, different cultures in different times and places will have sort of semantic equivalents to, to uh, genius, like, uh, for example, in, in Chinese civilization, there's a certain poet, Li Bo, for example, who is, they had a term for it, like a, a fallen angel. Mm. Oh, Tian Sai. What? Tian Sai, well, it means somebody who comes from heaven. Oh, yeah, someone comes from yeah, heaven. Yeah, yeah. And, and we also see that in, um, it means it, genius, basically. Yeah, I mean, it basically the translation means genius. would be genius. Or so. uh, divine uh, Michelangelo is what Vasari called Michelangelo, because mm. it was just like, where did this come from? Yeah. You know, it's just out of the blue, literally out of the blue. Yeah. And, and so that's like genius. It's In the case of, I mean, it is like genius. And of course, every culture has heroes of the mind. Um, uh -huh. But the Michelangelo case is interesting. I mean, Vasari uses in the first edition of The Lives of the Painters, uh, he calls Michelangelo divine like 35 times, and it's like 50-something times in the second edition. The word duino, right, the Latin, mm -hmm. had prior to that point been almost used I exclusively for religious figures. And you get Brunelleschi mm -hmm. described as a divine architect and so forth. And that in itself is a kind of shift from thinking about religious figures as especially touched to secular artists, right? right? I mean, Michael, he's still of the angels, right? He's angelic. I mean, he's, yeah, it's the right. same thing. He's, yeah. and, and of course, that is an old 
a way of thinking about genius that goes all the way back to, to Plato with this idea of kind of divine fury of, of right. genius. But it carries on. I mean, there's a whole sociology that develops uh, in Austria and Germany in the early part of the 20th century uh, that, that refers to the genie religion, sort of religion of genius, the modern kind of cult of genius. And this idea that Revenge. geniuses are specially touched, yeah, that they have a kind of uh, religious, uh, you know, aura. I mean, you see this in the cult of Einstein. I mean, Einstein mm -hmm. can see into the heavens, right? He, he, he can read the mind yeah. of God. He's called a Jewish saint, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and even the, the interest in his brain, it's like he's different from everyone else. It is know? like relics almost. Yeah. Like people are getting little yeah. bits of his fingers well, or something. Yeah. You had that, you have a quote from Schopenhauer that illustrates that, you know, talent hits a target yeah. that no one else can hit, and genius hits a target that no one else can, can see. see. Yeah. <laughs> So just out of the blue again. Yeah. 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 And of course, that has always existed, right? But right. It's, it's, the question becomes for a historian, well, why at certain moments does this, this cult emerge, and what does that say about the culture, right? So. Mm -hmm. And how is it shifting back? Because it appears to be shifting back to a more secular conception of genius. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the way, this, this idea we, we touched on earlier about, you know, the relationship of native ability, you know, native intelligence, you know, the genetic component, and, and you know, we, we didn't actually call it Flynn's Law, but we, we were talking about it for a while, the, the, the increase in intelligence over time. One of my favorite examples, there are, there are examples of cultures that came out of a nation that was relatively nondescript, and then in a very short time period became the center of creativity for the world. Okay? And one of my favorite examples is Islamic civilization. Except for poetry, um, the Arabs in Arabia had very little that very, was very distinctive in their culture in terms of co contributing to world civilization. They are converted to a new world faith. They launch a, a campaign of conquest. And they are all of a sudden forced to assimilate all these great ideas from India and Persia and uh, Greece. And, um, and they not only assimilated it, but they integrated it to a new culture, a new civilization. And all of a sudden, they're making phenomenal contributions, leaving in the dust all the rest of human civilization, like in particular certain areas, like mathematics, for example, and medicine. Um, just at, they invented the hospital. Because of that openness. Be because they were phenomenally open, because they were so naive. You know, they come out and, and uh, 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 they have the Koran and, and their, their armies, and, and all of a sudden, there's just all these books and, and experts on things. And uh, uh, there was a great uh, uh, caliph who set up what was called the House of Wisdom, where he deliberately said, there's a lot of things we don't know, mm -hmm. and it's not in Arabic. So we brought all these people in, and they were not necessarily Muslims. They were Christians, they were Manichaeans, they were uh, Zoroastrians. And it says, translate everything into Arabic so we don't miss out on anything. And the Ashkenazi Jews are a good example of this, too. I mean, right. The fact that you're getting out of your, and you know, being driven out of your home uh, is another example. You are forced to uh, invent new ways of solving problems. You're living in different through your exposure to new right. cultures and new ideas. Well, there's a lot of re actual empirical research on multicultural experiences yeah, yeah. as conducive to creativity. And the Ashkenazi Jews definitely had that as part of a way of life. You're not advocating warfare, though. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> and the same thing happened with the, with the all of a sudden golden age of yeah. Islamic civilization. Yeah. It was horrendously multicultural. Yeah. And by the way, a lot of people don't realize this. <clears throat> But even in the, in the periods of conquest, most of the people in, in Islamic countries, under the caliphate in particular, were not Muslim. They, they belonged to some other faith, usually Christian, Christian or, um, in the case of Persia, the Zoroastrians, and so forth. So it was a very, very multicultural society. So I've been confused about something. I was talking with a friend earlier. <clears throat> you know, that we have this um, explosion of human creativity around 30 or 40,000 years ago. And why did this happen? And one of the things, you know, you, you start looking at uh, the Shulian hand axe was the pinnacle of, uh, of modern hominid experience for 1.5 million years. And it was so stable for so long. And then 30 or 40,000 years ago, Boom, you know, you have agriculture, you have written language, you have culture, you have buildings, you have things that led to this. And in, in evolutionary time, this 30, 40,000 years is minuscule uh, for this to happen. So um, one of the things that 
you read about is that uh, people were coming out of Africa and people were going into uh, you know glaciers were retreating and 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 encroaching on northern Europe and uh, environments were changing in South Africa. I mean, was this uh, is this uh, of a theme that we're starting to see that this massive expansion of territory uh, through warfare or through uh, distribution of populations is the secret sauce of of human creativity right. and innovation. It, it's also possible that on relatively short time scales, if selection pressures change just a little bit, yeah. you can have a secular increase in the average intelligence of you know early hominids. Dying and, off of the, the Well, so for example, we <laughs> replaced the Neanderthals very quickly, actually. Yes. And they, yeah. they were around for about a million years and didn't really accomplish very much. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's quite possible. But we incorporated some of their DNA, and we incorporated which may have also DNA. been a, yeah. an interesting addition. But I, I think as we get closer to the genetic basis for in variations in human intelligence, we'll be able to look back, because we're getting quite good now at extracting DNA from dead uh, creatures. Yeah. Uh, we'll be able to look back at humans who lived 10,000 years ago, 20,000, 40, 50, and actually see how smart they were. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting that, uh, there, I'm trying to remember who it was. Um, I, I'm, I'm having problems because I, I know this guy primarily by reviewing manuscripts that he submitted for publication. <laughs> <laughs> Not a way you really know so, them. Yeah. And of course, they're, they're, it's, it's anonymous, so I'm by both ends, you know, double blind. So um, I, I can't draw in a blank. But anyway, who's argued that um, general intelligence was actually, you know, a lot of people in cognitive psychology talk about modules. You know, there's a module for this and a module for that, that, that evolution involved developing this various kind of module for language and um, module for mathematics, or at least arithmetic. And um, this person argued, I think he's at the London School of Economics, he argued that um, general intelligence is a specialized module. Very interesting concept. It's a specialized module that appeared when human beings started exploiting new niches in the environment. Because it, it, it was... Satoshi Kanazawa? Yeah, that's it. That's it. You know, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Eureka. Eureka. Um, and that's an interesting concept, because how, how do you adapt to totally new environments that have never been seen before? Well, you have this module that's very plastic, and it can absorb a lot of information, a lot of new information, and form new adaptations and, and so forth. And so it's kind of, it's something ironic twist to it that, that generalized intelligence may be a specialized module for adapting to new, new environments. And he's done that interesting research where he shows that general intelligence is, it correlates with um, a people's preference for novel behaviors. Like for example, one of the things I find really interesting is that highly intelligent people um, are more likely to like instrumental music, whereas less intelligent people are more likely to like vocal music. <laughs> I think you better be careful um, <laughs> treading into a dangerous ground Because here. instrumental music is you a relatively novel. for the dumb? <laughs> <laughs> I actually like both, you know, so I, I don't know how I feel about it. But. So, so Kanazawa is, is very controversial, and um, Cosmides yeah. and Tubi talk about two different modules in the brain, one that's a specialized problem solving and right. one's more general improvisation module. And this get, is more analogous to my thinking that we have these two competing neural networks, not competing, but cooperating neural networks, one designed to do this intelligent hypothesis testing, which is uh, rapid, accurate problem solving in the environment, and one to do hypothesis generation when we don't know what to do next. Right. And I think Cosmides and Tubi were probably a little more uh, accurate in, in their conceptualization of these, maybe not modules in the brain, but networks in the brain that we're now coming to appreciate. And Kanazawa is misappropriating uh, creative problem solving for intelligent problem solving. Right, right. But I don't know. By the way, we can argue about this for... <laughs> one development that I think is really absolutely mind-boggling for me, and you kind of hinted at, you know, when you talked about, um, like, the Swedish things. In, in a lot of Scandinavian countries, they're doing these studies that are the whole population. They don't have samples. <laughs> they have the whole population. I just reviewed a book uh, that was on the uh, relationship between psychopathology and, and mental illness by Kiaga. And he's in Sweden. And um, 
His original study he, for his doctoral dissertation, he had something like 700,000 but now he's expanded a sample to over a million. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's not uncommon to have sample sizes of order of millions now for a lot right. of these studies. So. And so he can do these fine distinctions that, turn, that you just can't do with small samples. Because he's, he's, he's breaking down um, creativity, for example, in all these sub areas and different kinds of achievement. You know, are you in a creative pr profession or not? You know, in the arts versus the sciences and that kind of thing. And then also breaking down the, g the gene side of it. So what specific kinds of genetic disorders are associated with which kinds? And, and these are studies that, with typical ends that most psychologists work with, you couldn't do because you'd have one case in each cell. <laughs> At the ISIR conference, they started to, you know, uh, brag about this by saying we're, we're using scientific notations for our for our n ten to the fifth. Uh, <laughs> oh, is that new? I didn't realize. Yeah. That. <laughs> <laughs> because psychologists, it's like we had, you know, a sample or neuroimaging. It's like we had a sample of fifty or sixty or maybe a hundred is a big sample. But they they they, they kept uh, going back and forth at this conference. Approaching ten to the sixth. Yeah, ten to the fifth. To, yeah, ten to the fifth. Uh, seven to the. <laughs> So the, Come the, on, guys. The talk Mine's that, bigger uh, than yours. My sample size is The talk that you mentioned size. at ISIR, which just happened, I guess it was a couple weeks ago, uh, <laughs> this guy James Lee is, and uh, Plumman and I are, and James Lee are all collaborators. Yeah. And Lee gave a very impressive talk. So the, the talk that James Lee gave was uh, the result of a big collaboration called the Social Science Gen Genetic Association <laughs> Consortium, which is an international consortium. There are probably something like 50 or maybe even 100 universities involved. And they have a pool of about 300,000 people for whom they have uh, some kind of cognitive measure, and then they have the genotype. 30 to the fifth. <laughs> and uh, they've reported at something called genome-wide significance, which is a statistical criterion, um, about 80 hits on specific gene variants that are associated with either slightly higher or slightly lower IQ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so probably the way this field is going to evolve is that um, as we get bigger and bigger sample sizes, we will eventually get to the point where we've identified the probably of order 10,000 places in the genome which are directly associated with either slightly enhanced or slightly decreased cognitive ability. And at that point, we'll be able to make predictions. So if you give me the genotype of a person, sight unseen, run it through the algorithm, it will predict this person's IQ is you know, 120 plus or minus 10. We can already almost do that for height. So we already almost understand the genetic architecture of height such that if you give me from, say, a crime scene the DNA from a person, I can say something about the height of that person. I can say something very definitive about eye color, uh, skin color, uh, things like that. But, but these complex traits, which are influenced by thousands of genetic variations, are going to be the last ones to be cracked. But they're going to be cracked probably in the next five years, I would say. Which is scary to me, because we might have, well, we already see this, this neo-eugenics movement, right. where you find out the genetics of your infant before it's even born, and decide this person can't be an NBA basketball player, or this person can't be a scientist. Not quite what I want. Not quite what I want, yeah. And so, I think this is really, you know, it is worth thinking hard about, because it's, it's right around the corner, and, you know, we, we may... Also modification. Well, so exactly, I'm that's what I mean, corner. yeah. And so, you know, we will say, uh, we're not going to do that in this country uh, for moral reasons, but somebody will. Uh, and then people from New York with money will start flying to the places of the world they will, <laughs> right. so their children can have an IQ of 15, 20 points higher than the rest. Uh, it's, and so, I, I, you know, again, I would say this is a time to study the history of this kind of stuff, too, because eh, it could get dark uh, for the, really, quickly. Yeah. For, the, for the million or so couples in the world each year that go through in vitro fertilization or IVF, in almost every case, they are producing multiple embryos. And there is already a decision process that is made of which embryo should be implanted to become the child and which one should be frozen or disposed of. Now, uh, that decision process right now is quite primitive. So the, the, the doctor may eyeball the growing blastocyst and say, this one has good symmetry. I bet it's healthy. The next step is to actually take a cell from one of the blastocysts and sequence the DNA so you know the genotype. And then you can exclude certain you know, severe uh, diseases. You may be able to say certain things about phenotypes like height or IQ. Um, so that's, that's where we're heading. And it's really all existing technology. The, the only last step is uh, just the ability to actually, with the algorithm, predict the phenotype from the genotype.
well, and cost, and Moore's Law is bringing down the cost. It's inexpensive. I mean, if, you, if you're not in the, it's quite expensive in the U.S., but if you go to Asia where the success rates are actually quite high, a cycle of IVF is a few thousand dollars. It's not very expensive. Oh, actually. I was talking about genotyping. The full oh, the genotyping is, yeah, we still need to accumulate all that data. It's getting right. closer to $1,000, yeah, and Correct. closer to $100, which will be Correct. So, so my prediction actually is that uh, if you define genius as having a particular IQ score, not having some outstanding unique contribution, but just the IQ part of it, humans are going to be much, there are going to be many more geniuses of that type on this planet 50 years from now than there are today. Because, because I think our, there's going to be an in, in incredible increase in human intelligence. Because an interesting place to live. Yeah. We'll need them to fight the rise of the machines. <laughs> well, that, that'll be the big fight. <laughs> I hope Schwarzenegger is still alive. General <laughs> On that note, yeah. And then, this work? I'm sure this has stimulated a lot of interesting questions from the audience, so we'd like to open it up to people if you would uh, line up uh, at the microphone and uh, please, uh, you know, speak in the form of a brief question. My takeaway from what you said is, in terms, in terms of the title of the uh, roundtable understanding genius is that we don't, uh, that there is no objective reality of genius, that uh, there are very, very many variants, uh, that high IQ alone is not good. If you have a high IQ and sit in a room and don't achieve something, you're not necessarily a genius. So I, I, um, I'm unclear about <coughs> um, what understanding genius does, unless it's to ultimately scientifically manipulate um, whatever the criteria you want to use to call genius. Because a, a great author, I mean, we've had authors that have genius, but they're not capable of being reproduced uh, uh, or tested. So uh, that's, what, that's what my uh, takeaway is. Am, am I being too narrow in my understanding of what you said? <laughs> I, I think your characterization is fair. I mean, this is, you're talking about a very complex aspect of human achievement, yes. and it's not going to be something we can just bottle and, uh, or define very precisely in a few sentences. So yeah, we're studying. We have a historian right. and psychologist. No, I, I brought a thermos hoping that you could bottle it. <laughs> <laughs> and I would take it back. But I, I very much I hope enjoy you didn't it. pay to get in here. Pardon me? I hope you didn't pay to get in here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm here Why, he wants his money I'm here, <laughs> I'm here on a genius scholarship. So. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. Look, but I, I can't say that we're, we're making progress in two areas. Identifying <laughs> talents that can become future geniuses and then developing environments that encourage the development of, that, of those talents. But have you defined it? Is there some objective? So you, we're identifying genius. How do you define it? Well, talents, I mean individual talents, math ability, the study yeah, of mathematically it, precocious youth is, is a very good example with uh, Ben Bow and, and uh, Lubinsky. Uh, Lubinsky. Lubinsky. But, but it uh, is a label that you put on after you think this is something that's a genius, an well, achievement it, worthy of labeling genius. But they don't, don't be little labeling because no, a lot of the people become genius once right. they've been identified as a genius. Yeah, and it's a, <laughs> <laughs> and it's a particularly I, important label, mathematically, right. yeah. preco mathematic precocity, and then now they're looking at visuospatial precocity. Some of these particular talents, I think, are very important for life outcomes. And whether they become geniuses or not, uh, we, need these, we need this human capital, which is another th uh, term that they use in, in uh, future generations. This, this human capital, whether it becomes genius or not, no, is incredibly that. important to cultivate. The, the, the variables, the components of achievement are worthy. Yeah. But yeah. the label genius, I mean, two people could look at these variables and one say that's a genius and yeah. the other say that's you mundane. Know, you know what they say about pornography, right? right. Yeah. You, you, know, <laughs> you know it when you see it? You know what the, uh, the Supreme Court define, says about right? it. Anyway. You know it. So I, I think we could make a list of 100 candidate for yes, genius yes. category, yeah. and probably we'd agree on 90% of it. There might be 10% that we wouldn't. So, so if that's enough to stop you from wanting to proceed further, then fine, we can work further on the definition. Yeah. But I think we, we have a kind of definition that I think is largely agreed upon here. And you can talk about, well, is there an IQ threshold? Uh, how do we identify these people early? Is there a way to measure their creativity when they're 14? Those are all yeah, things yeah. that people yeah. work on quite a bit. And um, so I think there is progress, but it's certainly not an answered. There's, there are no 
concrete answers to all these things. And then I okay. heard well. That's yeah, you. yeah you're, I think you were accurate. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yes, um, I'm wondering how much of what we attribute to geniuses is due to the time and the environment they live in as opposed to what they've actually done. If Einstein wasn't around 100 years ago, would somebody else have come up with the theory? And also, if Einstein lived now, would he come up with a theory that explains what we can't do now? There's a very interesting phenomenon, which we haven't talked about, yeah. uh, in science called uh, multiple discovery and invention, <laughs> where two or more people come up with the same idea totally independently of one another. And that's often taken, and I've actually done some research on that, empirical research on that, and, and fit some mathematical models to explain it. One of the things that's interesting about it, if you look at it very carefully, though, is that you can go ahead and say, well, yeah, um, both Newton and Leibniz came up with the calculus, for example, or both Wallace and Darwin came up with a theory of evolution by natural selection. But if you look at the theories very carefully or the inventions very carefully, they're not the same. Newton's calculus and Leibniz's calculus, is, are, are, calculus is very, very different, not, not just notationally, but in, in their general philosophical orientation. And in fact, a, a number of historians of mathematics have argued that the commitment of British mathematics to Newton's version of calculus set back mathematics in Britain <laughs> relative to the continent, where they were using the Leibnizian form of it. And you can see the same thing with um, Darwin and, and Wallace. They actually had a different version of evolutionary theory. Darwin thought that human beings could be included in natural and sexual selection, and Wallace did not. <laughs> <laughs> so what that means is that you would have gotten a different history of mathematics or a different history of, the evolu of evolutionary theory if one of those had died in the crib. Okay? So because each one has a kind of a, something unique that they're contributing. My, my but do you think we'd be in a different place now? Um, I think we would be, I mean, this is all hypothetical, right? But we talk about multiple universes. There may be another universe out there. There's a Wallace universe, yeah. yeah. What? We're in the Darwin universe. Right. There yeah, is a there's Wallace. another universe in the Wallace universe. Wallace published first. <laughs> yeah, right, one, right, right, so, right, exactly. I, well, my answer to your question is that <laughs> these things are very contingent. Any great achievement is mm -hmm. very contingent. So if Einstein had been born at a different time, different place, he would probably be recognized as a very insightful, smart guy, but he certainly wouldn't, almost certainly wouldn't have this reputation that he has in our world. Right. Um, Another point I'd like to make is that, uh, what was the other point I was going to make? Oh, Einstein actually technically, in terms of his mathematical ability, was not that strong. Mm -hmm. And so if he were today trying to do string theory, I think he would have quite a difficult time. Yeah. So, You know, the, the great Harvard uh, biologist, Stephen Jay Gould, had a, a line where he said, you know, I'm less interested in the, uh, the shape of Einstein's brain and more interested in the people of his skills who died, you know, uh, working in rice fields or what have you. And, and that does point to the, the role that context plays. Uh, and, and, you know, we can all do this. You can cluster genius. Fourth century BC Athens, 15th century Florence, New York in the 1950s. You know, when, mm -hmm. you, when you've got these, these really highly creative minds all working around common problems, that does something. Uh, right. Silicon Valley in the 1980s and 90s. Yeah. By the way, there's a really interesting example. You mentioned, I, I, you know, the Einstein example. Um, when the Nazis took over Germany, they started rewriting the history of physics because they didn't like the fact that there were too many high-quality Jewish, Jewish physicists. Jewish physics. Yeah. Yeah, that was and so um, it was actually one guy named Stark, notorious Nazi theoretical physicist. And so he wrote a book on famous physicists. And it's very interesting because most of the names look very, very familiar until you get to the 1930s. Mm. And all of a sudden, where you would expect a biography of Einstein to be, there's a biography of Hassenroh. <laughs> How many of you have heard of Hassenroh? <laughs> I've heard of Hassenroh. And for the <laughs> argument is, is Hassenroh actually came up with all the things in Einstein's theory that was important, which means non-Jewish, you know, the non-Jewish portion of it. And, and then everything else, of course, could be dismissed. And there were some things he did. Hassenroll did work on um, sort of the early stages of relativity theory and what have you, but he wasn't an Einstein. Okay, but it's an it's an illustration of how the, the cultural context. Of course, fortunately, that was a temporary one. But what if the Nazis had won? There you go. Yeah. 
<laughs> then we wouldn't be talking about Einstein. We'd be talking about Hasbro. Yeah, well, and, and he, I think even the history that we have is not reliable. So I think yeah. if you if you looked carefully, you would find gr grotesque distortions in some of our history. Right. So, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any evidence that geniuses are happy? Oh. <laughs> well, I, I think life satisfaction is actually, correct me if I'm wrong, somewhat positively correlated with IQ, right? So, yeah. so in that vague sense, yeah. um, I, I don't know that geniuses are necessarily tortured people. I, I knew Richard Feynman. Uh, he was quite happy. Mm -hmm. Terry Tao seems quite happy. Yeah, yeah. So I, That's anecdotal. It's <laughs> anecdotal. <laughs> well, I gave you the statistical result, which is pretty dry, yeah. which is just there's this positive correlation. But there, there is a problem that, uh, again, we have to go talk about different domains. Because one of the nice things about working in the sciences, you know, mathematics, is uh, you know when you're doing good stuff, you know? It, you, you can go ahead and work out the equations, double check your, your math <laughs> to make sure. But if you get the answer, you got the answer. You know, what and and there's and I've done I've done research too, and showing that the consensus, like for example in the in the hard sciences, they recognize up and coming stars very very quickly, because they know they know what's good and what's not. But if you're in the arts, you know that struggling artist in the attic, it often happens. You're not immediately recognized. So is it the recognition that makes them happy, or is it the high? <laughs> well, it, it, sometimes it, it the, it's a it's a two edged sword. You know, you have someone like Truman Capote, yeah, it's really great, you know, to get recognized very early. But then, all of a sudden, there's more pressure on you for your next novel. <laughs> you're the one-hit wonder, yeah. Yeah, and you're just going to parties and getting drunk, and, <laughs> and people were asking about your next novel. <laughs> right. So, I, I wrote a history of happiness before I worked on Genius, so oh, wow. uh, I thought about this a little bit. And, and the thing that I would say is that uh, there's clearly a myth associated with, uh, with Genius that correlates it with unhappiness, with mental instability, and so forth. So, um, um, we talked about uh, Aristotle's theory of that, that people of eminent achievement have uh, a superabundance of black bile, of melon ochre in the Greek. They have, they're, they're melancholy, right? Uh, and that idea gets kind of reinvented in the Renaissance and then again in Romanticism, and you get this idea, which I think is still part of our culture, that, that sadness is profound and happiness is sort of superficial, right? That to think and think deeply, you know, is, is, is like Walter ben Benjamin says, you know, every document of, of, of Western civilization is a document of barbarism, right? That truth is somehow dark. Uh, <laughs> Now, there may be something to that, uh, but uh, I think it's also a kind of uh, a stylization and a myth. Uh, and that, uh, as you say, you know, Richard Feynman, Einstein was, was comparatively happy. happy you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, in Silicon Valley, they're all really happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rich, <laughs> Money does yeah. buy. <laughs> so this isn't exactly a question, but sort of an observation. So I think um, what the public typically recognizes as genius, uh, finding, hitting the target that no one even saw before. So. It's highly specialized in a particular niche. So if you, if you think about Mozart, was Mozart also a great mathematician? Yeah. Probably not. So that in itself is some kind of a clue that it isn't a general brain mechanism. mechanism. Just maybe you can comment on that. Right. right. Well, um, why wouldn't it be a general brain? So you can have domain specificity, and you can have, but I think, you know, to, again, to have these modules of the brain, there's a module for art, and there's a module for math, and there's a module for, uh, for basketball, and there's a module for this. I mean, it, it, doesn't, it, doesn't make, it, it, it doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. It, it, so there has to be some general characteristics of brain functioning that come to play. Well, well, I, I don't know. I think I mean, the genius you know, shows up. Historically, actually, it, it, the, the idea has been that, that genius is a, you're born with it. It has to be original. It can't be learned, right? Talent can be learned and acquired, but not genius. And it's applicable to multiple domains, yes. right? So mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, Mozart made a choice early on, but he could have gone another way. And then you get examples of people who have genius level uh, capacity in multiple domains, like Goethe, right? Who is a yeah. kind of genius in poetry and playwriting, yeah. a good scientist to boot and so right. forth. Um, but I, I suspect that there's this general module wherever you went, there's this general brain module or general network that comes to play regardless of the individual domain that you practice. What, it, it might be that genius is more recognized in the sciences and in literature and, and that there are, there are genius capabilities that go less recognized, uh, but this, this human capacity uh, is, is, is a quite general cap yeah. capability. I'd like to just uh, toss out an approach to like intelligence that's kind of emerging now because until 50 years ago, 
very few educators even knew what a brain was. Like Descartes thought your brain was actually a storage place in your body for sperm. I mean, that's, which is true. But I have a little video just to put what I'm going to say in context. It's called, no, where I have five-year-olds who talk about life with more than most adults, and the five-year-olds are from New York, and they say, no adults left behind. <laughs> but I've asked over 30 professors, just to put this in context, if they knew the etymology of the word intelligence, which has been brought up today, none of them have known. I'm just curious if any of you know the etymology of intelligence, which you might have known in the second grade. Do any of you know? Okay, if you just cut the word in half, intelli means between, the other half of the word is legere, which means to choose. Intelligence literally means to choose between, that you're not using your brain supposedly until you're making a choice. Okay, but the point where I'm coming from is that basically the way the brain works with the new research in, in brain research now, basically the way your eyes work is the way your brain works. That's why you say, I see what you mean. I use my imagination. Mm -hmm. But ironically, you cannot see as you know without moving your eyes. We have a fovea, narrow point of, so you have to, you have to be moving your, your eyes very, so they say in a state of nature, when a human being, like say we all lived in the Amazon rainforest, we'd be moving our eyes left, right, up, down all the time, and our brains evolved that way. So in a state of nature, a human brain evolved to be aware of seven streams of awareness simultaneously. That's why seven is the sacred number. When we lock up our eyes on static letters we read and write, we actually atrophy the way our brain operates, and we go from seven, like, to one. So when you hear that a human brain is naturally, and maybe these people in these genius states are more open, that they're not locked in to just doing what they've been told. And so they're moving their eyes, they look, their brain is open and they have access to that seven, the natural sacred number. And because they do, they maybe have taken a stroll at a Plato's cave with the shadows or letters on the, but what about, you know, when you hear about the seven point natural awareness and the craziness that we're going down, we're dumbing ourselves down, atrophying the way our brain works from seven to one because we're locking up our eyes on letters and a letter and a name is actually just a name for an object or an image. It's a sound that doesn't mean anything. Can you, can you do me a favor and ask the question? Because you keep going around and we are a that bit it's lost. The, it's the seven point awareness that is a natural part of us that's been covered up. And now that it could be opened up and people could have access to it, and you say maybe genius comes from having access to that. What do you think about that is the new research that's taking us in that direction? I can address that. Thank you. That's bunk. Um, so. Uh, that's what? Bunk. <laughs> According to who? Me. So, <laughs> so um, you said so many things that I could disagree with, but I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time. So we know very little about how the brain actually functions as neuroscientists. So a lot of the assertions that you make are fundamentally flawed. Um, I, I, think, I think that the, the, the basis of your question is that you're getting to a point where you think that people are using their brain in a different way that you think is flawed, correct? No, it's not me. It's like, and just all of this stuff is coming out of behavioral optometry, vision training. It's, here's what I'd like to say yeah, about okay. that. People are using their brain in a different way, and it's being optimized to their environment. So the, that optimization to the environment just reflects a new environment. It's a different environment, but it's a new environment that that brain's being optimized for. I think we should get to the next question. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Hi, good afternoon. I came in towards the latter part, but um, I have a question regarding um, inheritance of genetic genius, well, so to speak. Uh, I don't know how you would put that factor. I'm one of a multiple birth of triplets, um, two boys and a girl. And basically, a lot of the factors that I notice in the geniuses in the family is that literally we can master things at an early age, since like seven, eight, nine, ten years old, and, every, and this is from the 60s and 70s. I'm last of the baby boomers. So, yes. You and me both. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 51. It, it feels great. But at the it doesn't same feel so great to me, but. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm doing yum. I'm doing yum. Um, the factor is that my brothers, I'm the only girl. Um, so the, the two identical boys, I'm wondering if this is a factor. The first boy was born. 
I had my own embryonic sac, which I call my condo. I came between the second. I came as the second. And then the third one, the two identical boys were separated. I came between. And I didn't understand if that was a factor of what happened to the oldest boy, because um, things started happening um, uh-huh. to him psychologically. And I wonder if me coming between the two births of the two boys <laughs> became, uh, you know, only God knows, but the family always said, it was you, you know, you, you came between the two identical boys, you separated them, and you know, I know it's he I said, think, she said talk. I think you answered your own question, only God knows that. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and trust me, that's been my sanity. <laughs> um, but the fact of my question is, again, is, um, they were geniuses way before I cons- considered myself a genius because where they mastered technology in the in old school days, there was always uh, motherboards hanging around, the technology, the big Zenith TV tubes. Um, I'm seven years old. Everyone's sitting in the living room. I know how to go in the back and fix the Zenith tubes, take the ones that's in the kitchen cabinet and fix the TV in the back and just sit back down and look again at the TV. And everybody's like, what did you just do? How, how did she just do that? There's a lot of things I've done in my life I could not never explain. I'm 51, I still can't explain. But it can come to me with numbers, even visions, and I can master it. Where it takes someone to go to school for eight years even to get a master's degree. So uh, on that factor, it, it, it's kind of coming to me later now than earlier. <laughs> and I was trying to figure out the geniality of it, of okay. you know the inheritance and... Okay. But, yeah, techs, doctors, lawyers, yeah, easy age. Like, we can master it. I studied neurosurgery since eighth grade. Can I say something? You okay. Raised, Thank so you. you raised an issue that um, we actually didn't talk about. Actually, right. a couple issues that we didn't talk about. Oh, okay. I thought I missed it. Then. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, there's so many things that you can talk about when you're in this topic. Okay. Um, and one thing that is really interesting to me is there is some work on the intrauterine environment as a factor. In, um, in the emergence of at least certain kinds of genius. And um, like there's something called the, I mean, it's not completely established. Are you familiar with the notion, right? That uh, the inner uterine environment can influence brain growth at a very early age that has lifelong consequences, uh, particularly for developing certain kinds of exceptional abilities like in mathematics or music, for example. Um, and, but we still don't understand it. Um, but we do know, I mean, obviously, brain chemistry is being influenced by th- that which ambiotic cycle you happen to be in, <laughs> right? If it's a different one than, than others. Yeah, we just Another issue, thanks to your prompt, is, is birth order. Um, it was actually Francis Galton who did the first uh, study of birth order. And, um, and of course, you, see, you have two brothers. Birth order interacts with, um, with gender as well. I mean, I did a study, really interesting study. Well, we researchers always think we do really interesting studies. <laughs> you may disagree. You actually do interesting studies. <laughs> but I, I did, a, stu- I did a, a study of, of eminent women in psychology, eminent scientists in, uh, in psychology, and um, women, and comparing them to um, comparably eminent men, looking at birth order. And I found that um, there's a tendency for and this is just significant, a tendency for, um, not only for women to be firstborns, firstborns are, are overrepresented among scientists, okay? But they're even more likely to be firstborns than males are, and they're even more likely to come from smaller families, and they're extremely unlikely to have older brothers who just mm. spoil things in terms of <laughs> the development of talented female scientists. So there's all these other factors, you know, yeah. it's a whimsical thing, like, like birth, birth order, order. Yeah. or, you know, the chemistry of your intrauterine inter- inter- environment can have, let me just give you another arbitrary thing that's sort of like birth order, but even more arbitrary than birth order. There was a study done of um, music competitions. You have, the, you know, these big things like the you know, Clyburn kind of competition. People come in, they play a piece of music, and uh, they deliberately have a, a piece of music that nobody knows, including the judges, to, to equalize things. Hmm. So they're not all doing the Rachmaninoff third or something. 
And um, what's interesting is that they find that the people who are more likely to win the prize are the people who perform later in the competition because by then, everybody's more familiar with this new piece of music. They've heard all the little glitches. And it's, and by the way, it's random assignment. Mm -hmm. It's random right. assignment, or what order you perform. Okay. Just a minute. Okay. I mostly, <clears throat> among creative people, spend time among creative people. Artists, poets, uh, and um, writers. And I could say that, um, among artists, it's very few really intelligent people. <laughs> <laughs> and better you more, said that. More, better you said that than him. <laughs> much more, much more among poets and more among writers. And they try to suppress their intelligence with illegal drugs very often. So my, my um, first question about uh, your, uh, how you can comment that people deliber deliberately try to suppress their intelligence with illegal drugs to be more creative. Mm. And second uh, question is, uh, it's several years ago I read about um, um, several women <coughs> who took sperm from Nobel laureates and uh, give birth to kids. And then when these kids um, <clears throat> start to grow, they encounter very big problems how to raise them. And now they're fighting for ability to learn who really were their parents and how they can connect with these kids because um, <clears throat> it was like manipulation of genetics, yes? And it seems like you have at least to love the person who give birth to your child <laughs> that understand what is going on because they just don't understand. And they are autistic with problems and they don't, it's, you, kids also suffering. They don't know what to do. So if we manipulate genetics of our kids, we won't know how to deal with it. Okay. So that's two questions, illegal drugs, and if we manipulate ge genetics, would we recognize it and grow, uh, raise our kids? Mm -hmm. uh, can I address the first question, if I understood it correctly? Um, about lot, suppressing intelligence in the Yes, artists. a lot yeah. of artists uh, and musicians. Since, since, to... since we're at the Sacramento Analytic Institute, I, I, can, I should bring in Freud at least somewhere, okay? Because Freud actually addressed this issue in one of his essays. He was dealing with the question of why is it that critics aren't very creative? Mm -hmm. okay. but, they're very, but they're smart. They, they know everything. Yeah. They know everything about yeah. films. They know everything about novels, everything about poetry, and they can't create one themselves. Okay. And he specifically And they said, know that, right? And, and, they <laughs> and it's because they're, they're 100% secondary process. They never allow the primary process any latitude to second the primary come up, process coming up with some kind of crazy idea is merely squelched. By the super ego. That would make a yeah. lousy movie, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think Dean's theory seems very plausible to me because I think if you want to be open to the creative process, you maybe want to suspend judgment. And the kind of thing we call intelligence is a kind of analytical judgment that maybe you're trying to suppress when you try to get new influences. As far as your second question, so I think there's been at least one book written about the Nobel Prize sperm bank. And uh, oftentimes when people review that book, they, they, because, they, because they don't think statistically, they just think anecdotally, they try to portray it as a huge failure or something. But if you just made a prediction based on genetics of what would happen if you took sperm from a bunch of Nobel laureates and you gave it to a bunch of uh, recipients, you'd probably say that the kids will be somewhat higher in IQ on average because they're getting uh, genes from a high IQ, uh, at least one of their parents is high IQ, and probably the other one maybe as well. Secondly, maybe some eccentricities like uh, things like autism might be more prevalent in that population. And I think that's roughly what was found. So I don't think it's, I think it more or less conforms with what just on the basis of genetic 
theory you would predict would have happened with this sperm mm -hmm. bank. Now, some people who wrote the books on this would say, oh, well, it's awful that it didn't produce another Nobel Prize winner. It should have definitely produced a Nobel Prize winner, otherwise it's a failure. But I think that that's going way too far. Yeah. No, I'm talking about how to raise a child that you don't have any connection. That's that's the problem. What, you mean genetic evening. connection, or because no, they are half? Because uh, no, no, it's it's just little kids, and yeah. they these women don't know how to raise them. They have very big difficulties with these kids because okay. they cannot connect with them at all. I see. Yeah. Well, that's I think the problem. But is it different than the problem they say a parent of an autistic child would have? Similar. No, I'm maybe similar. I don't yeah. know. I'm okay. not this woman, you see. Okay. I'm just mm -hmm. saying about the problem that you have genetics yeah. from someone you don't know at all. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, but there must be also, I would predict, some similarities between the child and the mother, and you would think that maternal love is still there and everything. So I can't, it, 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 I, it, I wouldn't expect it to be as, quite as bad as <laughs> you described it. But. Okay. Well, I have some problems with the language you've been using, and I have a problem with the concept of IQ test. Uh, first of all, um, genius, maybe the word has been overused, maybe we should say creativity, because genius has so many problems connected to it. Um, the other aspect of things, the, um, the IQ test, um, well, I, I find it a very problematic thing. And I always see the creative individual as having a mode of thinking, uh, maybe with different synapses, different ways of approaching something, and an IQ test is too standardized. And I remember taking when I was so bored that I decided uh, I couldn't bother with it, and I looked at my neighbor and I said, I'll just copy that. And then they told me, oh, you, you're wonderful. You're an average person. I said, oh, thank you. I've been hoping. But uh, I, think, uh, I think we have to re find a different way to define intelligence. And I think it's a very complex the way creative people think. Uh, the, it's, it's some form of deviancy even. Maybe they can't even deal with the normal situations of things. Sometimes I think of it as the pearl that has an irritant and they have to find a way around a problem. So I think the problem in the brain is not going to be very standardized. It's going to be a very com and I'm, I'm, I'm an artist, but it's a very complex uh, aspect of how a dip, different synapses connect different things. And creativity lies in this strange way of organizing and assimilating the world. And we have so much knowledge now that it's true. One of the problems you brought up is for true creativity, it's very difficult because there's so much more of a branch of knowledge than even Leonardo da Vinci had to have. And I, I know they're not questions, but I can try. Yeah. And, uh, huh? What question? You want question? question? All right. Well, the question is the structure of the brain. Uh, can it be measured by an IQ test? Are we really speaking about the true measurement? And the other thing is the conflict between uh, individual intelligence and collective intelligence, where a group of individuals are working out a problem together. Then we're in, into another problem. But I'll, I'll just keep the structural problem of the brain. Uh, do we really know what intelligence is or how it operates? That's your question, Guy. <laughs> so um, we've correlated intelligence tests with the structure of the brain. Uh, many researchers have done this and found the correlations to be low but uh, significant across studies. So I wrote a paper in 2007 in uh, be uh, Behavioral and Brain Sciences where I reviewed all the studies looking at the correlations between the structure of the brain and these various measures of intelligence. And that's called the parietal frontal integration theory of intelligence. So it, it, it summarizes kind of a network in the brain that underlies um, the ability of humans anyway uh, to express um, intelligent behavior as manifested on these particular kinds of tests. So there is uh, non, uh, a, a significant uh, correlate between the structure of the brain and performance on these tests as you would expect. Uh, get, whether it's creativity, uh, personality, intelligence, uh, just about anything our brain does, motor behavior, um, there's going to be some uh, correlates uh, that are found uh, in, in, in the brain, and, and certainly we found that with intelligence. 
I would like to address the collective intelligence idea because I, we, this gets back to what we were talking about earlier about collaboration being very important in, in certain fields, particularly in the sciences. And one thing I think is fascinating is that there's, is, there's a kind of isomorphism between how creativity operates in a group and how creativity operates within a single individual who's highly creative. What I mean by that is, I, we mentioned earlier that highly creative people tend to score very high on openness to experience, and they have multicultural experiences. They have lots of very wide interests. Um, you know, they're just very, very open to a lot of different possibilities. They have a lot of different hobbies. Um, there's one interesting study, for example, that stratified scientists from the elite of Nobel laureates to only members of the National Academy of Sciences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And then people who Pretenders. didn't even get that high and looked at their, their avocational interests, you know. And it was beautiful, you know, the more artistic interests as you go higher up. Um, so that, that diversity is really interesting, that, that complexity, that heterogeneity of their minds, their interests, and their, even their expertises. Uh, like Einstein could play the piano. He could also sell a boat, but I don't know how much expertise is involved in that. Um, if you look at groups, one of the main predictors of creativity in a group is how heterogeneous the group membership is. Do they differ in their, their training? Do they differ in gender? Do they differ in ethnicity? It's, it's, it's this amazing phenomenon that a really diverse group. So in a sense, what you do, you're having is, instead of having all that diversity in a single brain, you're having sort of division of labor mm -hmm. of diversity is distributed within the group membership working on a problem. It becomes a neural net that solves the problem. Yeah, a neural problem. network, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you have to have lots of different <laughs> yeah. abilities to be yeah. able to solve that problem well, yeah. Right. Okay. Hi. Um, doctor, I have like two five-second questions. Do you have time? That's I just okay. Want, I just want to respect two five-second questions are good. Yeah, In the form of question. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right>. Wow. <laughs> The first one is, uh, you know, working hand in hand was mentioned and lateral conductivity. Um, you know, I was wondering if there's anything to left and right brain uh, balancing. They're brain so, balancing centers. Yeah, I can, I can answer that very quickly. So this left brain right thing is considered to be neuromythology uh, at this point. And, and certainly you need all of your brain to do creative tasks as you do to, need, to do intelligent tasks. So mm -hmm. um, th this comes from work uh, by Sperry and Gazaniga. Uh, in the 1970s who uh, did corpus callosotomies on patients with epilepsy, it's a long story. But they found that the hemispheres uh, function rather differently. Uh, language tends to be in the left hemisphere and nonverbal stuff tends to be in the right hemisphere. This got taken up by the popular press like wildfire. So if one is intensely active, the other one is not nearly as active? No. Versus working on a activating the other one with certain so, activities? Uh, so during creative activity, the activation pattern is moving around during in these different networks, and there's probably suppression of different parts of the brain, activation of the other different parts of the brain, but that moves around from place to place. It. It's not isolated. It's not isolated. Uh, the other question is, any research on proactively cultivating EQ um, and the correlation with a rise in IQ as a result? Um, this is an easy question because I don't know hardly anything about EQ. Um, I uh, would expect, I think, you might Others know something a little bit about EQ that it is probably a little, uh, uh, it, it, it is um, emotional intelligence or emotional uh, in, uh, intelligence is going to be somewhat positively related to intelligence because mm -hmm. of the general factor of mm -hmm. intelligence, uh, I would guess, but uh, I don't know anything beyond well, that. I, the problem is, is that the psychometric properties yeah. of emotional intelligence is not up at the same cool. level. Um, it turns out to be a very heterogeneous construct. Yeah. Um, it's just sort of like creativity in comparison to general intelligence. So it's a real mess. Mm -hmm. so you know what's going there's on. There's no correlation study as far as, oh, you work hard on raising your kid's EQ that would bring I, I don't know of any. I mean, I will, I, there may be a, I wouldn't know. Okay. But I would like to answer, I, I, I don't know if this is valid enough, but I remember seeing some study where, apropos of this, you know, this mythology of, yeah. you know, right versus left hemisphere, it was very interesting where they looked at, was, maybe it was HOPE or something like that, H-O-P-P-E? Hop. Is that something? Yeah. HOP? Yeah. yeah. And it was something about, um, that they can't understand metaphors. 
because they have to put things together from both sides of the brain. Hmm. Like, um, oh, you mean like, like a neurological study of patients? And, and yeah, and, and one, of the, one of the experiments I thought was patients. really brilliant is that it, you show people a film clip where there's a kid playing on a swing and then a ball goes out in the street and the kid evidently runs out in the street and then all of a sudden you just see this empty swing. Yeah, what happens next? Yeah. Or what happened? Right. What happened? And people who are, have normal intact corpus, corpus callosum, callosum. Yeah. figure that out yeah. and people who have split brains can't figure out what happened. Oh, it, it gets weirder <laughs> than that. You have patients that will be you know, buttoning their shirt with one hand and unbuttoning it with the other. <laughs> The, the, the two hemispheres function independently right after the surgery. So I've had yeah. girlfriends like that. And, 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 and if the hemispheres can't com communicate from a neuro, I'm a neuropsychologist by training, but from a neuropsychological perspective, it gets really interesting if you can show someone a key only in their right hemisphere, uh, for example, and you can do this with tachistoscopic uh, presentation on the retina, they, and they can't access it. They can feel it. They can touch it. But, but they can't name it. They, yeah. they don't have access to the language module. They can't mm. name right. the key. It's really fascinating yeah. uh, to, to see the modularity then of the, of the brain functioning when you can split the corpus. So corpus. if you want to increase your creativity, do not get a split brain. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> you need both halves of your brain to be creative. Or intelligent, for that matter. <laughs> or have la, la, last three questions. So, uh, first of all, thank you for having this discussion, and thank you for streaming it live. My friend, friend is watching it right now, and he has the question. Can you comment on the current state of research on enhancing fluid intelligence? Do we know of any methods just enhancing that? Enhancing. Part? Oh, yeah. yes. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, Dr. Yegi um, from California, you see Irvine, I believe she is at now, uh, did some working memory training uh, to in increase intelligence. And the theory is that you can do this dual end back type of, uh, which is a very difficult task to do where you're keeping streams of information going. Yeah, I've tried it. Yeah, it's very unpleasant, actually, if you, you want to shoot yourself after you do this type of task, <laughs> which is uh, the, the best decision you can make. So, um, but the, the, the theory was that you did, did this working memory task, and because the working memory networks, our parietal frontal distribution, overlap the intelligence networks, you could increase your intelligence. So she uh, uh, published this in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, and um, many people have uh, attempted to replicate this in different ways. She's replicated it. And it, it's very equivocal about whether this uh, actually uh, does. And the, and the research, the best uh, um, digestion of the research that I can give you is that there's near transfer and far transfer. And if you do a working memory task, you are likely to increase working memory. But the likelihood of increasing intelligence, which is kind of far away, is rather low. If you do an attention task, you're likely to increase attention. If you do a visuospatial task, you're likely to increase visuospatial ability. But to have that transfer to other tasks is um, not been well demonstrated through replication. It's, it, you know, it's, it, we used to have that belief that brain exercise is yes. just good for you. It's, it's, like, it's like exercising your muscles. It doesn't yeah. matter if you're lifting a, a, a dumbbell or whatever. Uh, you know, lifting up is lifting up. But it doesn't seem to be that. The, the case, you know, so... Or you know, that like, easy. Yeah, that yeah, or, or, yeah or you, so that you say, learn Latin and, and, and it makes you smarter. Well, no. <laughs> I'd, rather do, I'd rather do the dual end back task. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, learn Latin. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. No, we had three. Now you're going to be the fourth. No. I, I have two there, and okay. I, I, All right, go ahead. I, I, about but 40 that, years ago, I wrote a song called I Used to Think I Am a Genius. <laughs> I had great fun singing that to roomfuls of genius. I just want to quote the last line. I used to think I am a genius. Please don't ask me why. But now I know I'm not a genius. I'm just a wonderful guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next. Perfect. <laughs> Is there a corollary for genius 
being attached to ineptitude in other areas, such that people like Einstein might not have been able to wash his clothes or set the table while he was, you know, uh, fastnesses of uh, psychic uh, physics and so forth. But I have noticed very, very intelligent people often don't manage without somebody to do their washing or clothing or set the table or something like that. Thank you. I think that's a very interesting question. So there's a stereotype that we all know about, right, that the, the great genius can't handle everyday things, can't tie their shoes, they're clumsy. And I, I'm guessing that if you really careful, carefully study this issue, it's not true. But I think that if you were intensely interested in your work and you just wanted to achieve in that narrow sphere as much as possible, it would be great if you could outsource your daily <laughs> tasks <laughs> to someone else to help you free up... Um, I, I really, I would love to see a study, actually. Uh, I, I mean, I, if you just look at the sort of, not focused on genius, but just focused on sort of the broader population and sort of IQ, you find that people who have IQs, they tend to also be good at lots of things. So mm -hmm. they're not necessarily incapable. And Terman actually found this, I think, in his group, that they were quite healthy, um, physically strong, healthy uh, group of people, and they didn't, they didn't seem to have uh, particular right. handicaps. So. But you mentioned, I, I mean, I, I think what it is, you do have these obviously strong cases, conspicuous cases like Albert Einstein, but even, the, even him, you have to be very careful, because a lot of times he was very smart. I mean, he, yeah, he's, he's, he's got his priorities, and he wants to work. So like, uh, yeah, he didn't wear socks, okay? Um, but. The reason, he had a very good reason for not wearing the socks. It's because he always got holes in them, and he says, it's ridiculous. Always uh, wear something that just you wear out. So he stopped wearing socks. He was once asked for his phone number, and he said, well, okay, let me see if I can find it. And, he's, and he said, well, you don't know your phone number? And he says, I can always look it up. <laughs> so I, I, I think that's actually smart. He's got his priorities kind of organized in the right way. <laughs> corollary with that is an outsized appetite, I think, goes with high intelligence, such that I know Einstein was very um, sexual with uh -huh. many women. Uh, many men are, of course, but um, oh. I think... In <laughs> or would like to be. Yeah, many women are. <laughs> that's part of the openness to experience. Yeah. <laughs> that's, part <of> the <laughs> that's part of the human experience. <laughs> but but I, I, I make a connection between an outsized brain with an outside need for food, uh, perhaps sexual appetites, as well as other inputs that feed the creativity. And I don't, I don't think it's ridiculous to hypothesize that. Well, I mean, Newton we yes. never had a lover, uh, <laughs> and, and neither did Immanuel Kant. Um, but that, that connection between sexuality and genius is a long history. In fact, the, the word genius that I mentioned before, the Latin, comes from the, the Latin verb genogenere, which means to generate. It gives us genes and genitals. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's, there's an association drawn from very early, early on that productivity is you know, somehow sexual. If you've ever seen the famous uh, statue uh, by uh, um, uh, Rodin of Balzac, that's in the 6th arrondissement of Paris, you know, he's, he's in his, he, he always wrote at night and he would wear these great overcoats and, and there's a kind of conspicuous bulge, bulge. there in one part. <laughs> well, in his studio afterwards, they found there are all these studies of Rodin holding his phallus. And so this is this kind of myth of, you know, the, the protean artist who is sexual, but I think that's largely a myth, uh, but nonetheless. Yeah. Well, it, it also uh, touches upon um, perhaps something that we've um, not quite talked about. I mean, it's been a very um, cortical-centric discussion, but if somebody like Pankcep is, is correct in terms of you know, the seven areas of the brainstem, you know, seeking, rage, lust, play, etc., that, you know, what contribution does this have, you know, to uh, what, what we consider to be high, you know, high levels of creativity, genius? Oh, certainly, yeah. I mean, it must be there somewhere, these, these very basic type of uh, instinctual types of uh, response are either have to be kept at bay while we're doing these higher uh, meaningful things or incorporated somehow. Uh, so uh, they're, you know, open area of research and we must understand uh, how they play and they may play out in these sexual appetites, uh, they may play out in addictive appetites and other appetitive uh, type of behavior in very important ways that we don't understand. I think that's fascinating. Last question, is there uh, uh, the your last, other question? Yeah. The last All right. you discussed yours will be the last. <laughs> about intelligence testing at the IVF stage before pre-implantation. Pre 
what whatever's possible right now, how much would that cost? And if there's an equivalent of a more law, what we can what we can expect that to cost in five or ten years? Yeah. So the main issue now is the availability of large amount of data so you can build the predictive model. So we just don't have good predictive models for cognitive ability based on genotype now. We do for things like height and other things, but not for IQ yet. Um, the cost is actually not very high. So the cost to do the genotyping is on the order of a few hundred dollars, actually, uh, for that embryo. And so um, I don't think cost is the real barrier. The barrier is just uh, getting enough data uh, so that you can build the predictive models. I think that I think that these predictive models, whether they are predictive of disease conditions, disease susceptibility, or physical proportion, whatever it is, they will be among the most valuable pieces of intellectual property uh, because they they basically deal with the internal blueprints of the human species. And so, whether they'll be open sourced, uh, I don't know. Okay, last question. Um. Edison, Einstein, Leonardo da Vinci, Steve Jobs, Branson, Newton. They say they were dyslexic, right? And a lot of others. Is, it, is dyslexia really a learning disability or is it something to do with the genius? And also um, the visual and verbal, right? A lot of these people had visual thoughts. They didn't think verbally, right? So again, is dyslexia really a learning disability, or is it just a different way of thinking? And we're being, or and people with dyslexia are being dictated by the people in the bell curve in the middle. For, for, with their learning style. Well, from a neuropsychological perspective, dyslexia reading is a relatively new human behavior that's rather right. unusual uh, for the brain to do, but the brain can do it. And the brain of most people can do it, but the brain of some people cannot. Um, so dyslexia is an interesting neuropsychological phenomenon and people who are dyslexic use their brains in different ways and so they um, develop other strengths to compensate for this uh, lack of reading ability and that may have something to do with their creative ability and you do see some, I think some studies support an over, slight over-representation of uh, dyslexia and creative endeavors but uh, um, I, th I think um, there's something interesting there but like the the, the mad genius, uh, I think we, yeah, do, the mad genius too. we wouldn't want to put too much in it. There's something interesting there worth exploring, but we wouldn't want to have an equivalence. Because you're dyslexic means that you're more uh, 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 likely to become a genius. The fact that you have a really say, high... You wouldn't say that. It, it, well, no. The fact that you have a really it's high it. IQ means that you're inevitably going to become a genius. It makes things more interesting as these things coalesce and come together in the individual brain that you have a high IQ and that you might be dyslexic and that the conditions were right that um, genius may emerge, but uh, we don't have the, 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 the recipe that gives you that, that inevitable. It may, it may not even be a recipe because it could be that we have several alternative ways of attaining the same end. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I, I uh, had worked with a graduate student and we did publish uh, earlier this year a, a study we did of eminent uh, African Americans and uh, to test this hypothesis. Uh, and, and this hypothesis turns something we call diversifying experiences that somehow we got to break a person away from the path of um, conventional thinking, conventional learning, you know, towing a line, conforming to what everybody else believes, if you're going to become a major innovator, okay? Yeah. The thing is, though, there's no one way you need to do that. There are multiple ways you could do that. So there's a large inventory of um, uh, childhood experiences and things like um, both physical and cognitive disabilities are on that list mm. that seem to have higher frequencies, but they're not high enough to say, well, that's essential. It's just one of several different options. A parent, what we, a parent dying is another yeah, one. Yeah, parent dying, yeah. orphanhood is yeah, another, orphan, another yeah. thing. Um, you know, some kind of trauma in early childhood yeah. often yeah. Is, is associated with, with uh, later creative achievement. Yeah. But you can have too much. We talk about a sweet spot. Mm. So you have all these things you can, dyslexia can be one of those mm -hmm. things, you know. 
And, um, and then you find a sweet spot, and that sweet spot will vary according to other things. So the reason why I was a focus on African Americans is they obviously have a lot of diversifying experiences beyond what majority culture Americans have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And we actually looked at things like, you know, major episodes of discrimination and, and things like that in their lives. Uh, these are all very eminent people. Um, one, um, like Maya Angelou was in the sample. Uh, in fact, we published the study just before she died. <laughs> but anyway, um, and what we found, of course, is that for African Americans, the sweet spot is lower. Mm -hmm. So you can have too much of these diversifying experiences, mm -hmm. okay? Whereas if you're in the majority culture, um, you, where the, the threat of just doing everything the way everybody else is doing it is much greater, then you need a bigger push of these things. But the point, to get back to the original question, is that all these things are involved, and if you have too many of them, then you're going to be over the sweet spot. So if you have dyslexia plus you lost your mom, <laughs> or whatever it happens to be, that may be too much for you to handle. And of course, there's also a resiliency factor that may be in, 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 in your own constitution. Some people have more resiliency than others as well. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you.